Hello guys and magandang gabi Manila. I hope everyone is safe and well wherever part of the globe you are. So our local time now is 11.17 p.m. And so uh, before every everything else, I'm Kabuki Cat. Me and Salanga Nisa will be your host for tonight, while DJ Lumpia will be in charge of our sounds and visuals. So um, to everyone here, welcome to Brush Point's first ever live demo. And before we start, let me go through a few details first. So um, don't forget to visit our YouTube channel, which we will link down below. And to our foreign audiences tonight, our podcast and interviews are in Filipino, but our educational videos are for everyone. And um, also, we will have our Q&A session at the end of the demo. So keep your questions at hand. And so without further ado, let me introduce to, to you guys our guest speaker for tonight, which is Big Time Studios Art Director, Carlo Aureliano. Woo! <laughs> don't have clap sounds, but yeah. Woo! <laughs> What's up? What's up? Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, maganda gabi. Oh, wait, hold on. This is supposed to be in English, right? Like, uh, <laughs> English, English. Yeah, English. You know, educational, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, my my name is Carlo Arellano. Uh, I I am uh, an art director, and um, I got my start. Uh, before we get started, let me just give you guys a short introduction of myself. Um, I, I got my start uh, working in movies on such things as Planet of the Apes. Um, and uh, Van Helsing, and from movies I moved on to video games, working um, on World of Warcraft, um, and a bunch of things for Insomniac games. Um, I worked on God of War, um, and now I'm an art director, and I have been so for, uh, I would say about 10 years now. Um, I'm often teaching, I've been teaching since um, almost the beginning of my career. Uh, I studied at the University of Santo Tomas, um, and uh, I, when I came back here to the United States, I, I studied at a place called Associates in Art, a place that no longer exists, but was an amazing place because I learned uh, about kind of uh, traditional uh, advertising illustration over there. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at things like uh, Andrew Loomis and, and Gil Elvgren, um, even, um, even uh, J.C. Leyendecker, mm -hmm. um, the students of these people were the... The, the people that were teaching over there. So it was amazing. Um, so today, uh, I'm just gonna give you guys a short demo. Uh, it's not too involved, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, give, give a little to, 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 to the Philippines and, and just uh, talk a little bit about the industry and give you guys some basic principles on how to design. So uh, I'm sure if you've gone to my art station, you've seen some samples of my work. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, you know, and, and one of the things that, that I pride myself in is the ability to do a variety of different styles, right? Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere from like Disney-like or, or, or even anime to uh, very realistic science fiction. Um, and th this, this approach is not for everybody, uh, but I always wanted to be the kind of guy that was useful in production, no matter what the production happened to be. Yeah. You know, so um, if I ended up working on a Disney movie, I could do that. If, I, if I'm working on Star Wars, I can do that. I mean, you can tell, like, if you look at the costumes from Planet of the Apes and the stuff that I did in World of Warcraft, they're incredibly different um, yeah. IPs. And I've even worked on Ratchet and Clank. So um, although my initial thing that I learned uh, was more realistic science fiction and
So um, F stands for form follows function. That is, um, uh, so the entire acronym is FACTS, F-A-C-T-S, right? So I do this yep. so that people can remember very easily these principles. F stands for form follows function. I'm sure you guys have learned that from a bunch of different um, designers, and it's something that you learn in school if you're a designer. Uh, things tend to look like what they are, right? Yeah. Uh, a Corvette looks fast, a tank looks armored, right? Um, a rhino looks strong. So uh, th there are things that we're trained to re uh, recognize visually, but also things tend to shape, to be shaped uh, relative to what they do, right? Uh, the second one is archetype, okay? Sometimes we call them tropes or, yeah. or um, let's see, do, these are recurring <laughs> themes in human storytelling mm -hmm. like for example um darth vader's the black knight right mm -hmm. and, and he's also death so i mean look at it he's got the skull head mask he's got a lightsaber which is really his his scythe that he uses to reap people yeah. right um and so these archetypes allow us to instantly recognize uh what the storytelling function of something is mm -hmm. right uh, for example, if you're watching Mandalorian and you look at the, the Mandalorian, he's obviously like a Western style bounty hunter, right? He's, he's kind yeah. of like the, the, the Western hero. He's a, he's a cowboy, really. Yeah, he's a cowboy, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but, it, you know, cowboy and samurai have very close archetypes in the 20th and 21st century, right? Mm. Uh, it's also lone wolf and cub when you look at that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the next step is characterization. Now, characterization are the unique things on a character that gives you the character's personal history, right? Uh, that's what takes your uh, trope, you know, from being just a trope to being a person, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and the you know a lot of concept artists, um, if their work looks boring or not memorable. It's probably because they're not putting enough character in, in, in their thing. It, it looks, when people say, oh, that looks generic, um, that's probably what's happening here, right? Like, for example, let's start off with a, a basic archetype. Um, martial artist, right? Now, you know, if you do like a basic guy with like a karate gi, that's one thing. Let's go, uh, let's go with a Muay Thai fighter, right? make him bigger than a normal Asian. And then, you know, he's bald and he has a, s a scar across his chest and an eye patch. Now it's Sagat. You yeah. Know? So Sagat is um, a very specific character that is expressing an archetype or a trope, but is a person. Okay. So that's characterization. Mm -hmm. T stands for tools. This is incredibly important when it comes to video games. Now it happens in in in, in movies as well, but tools represents um, the um, the thing that the, the things that the character has to fully express their function, right? To allow them to uh, uh, function either narratively or in, in a gameplay situation in the way they they need to, like. Uh, Dante has rebellion and, um, you know, his his guns, right? Yeah. Like, every, he's, he's got every... his swords and his guns. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, League of Legends is, is full of these things because they have obvious mm -hmm. sources of power, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Batman has his utility belt. Uh, Predator has all of this stuff. But even, even like, it can be a, a an organic thing, too, like the way... Uh, the the xenomorph from aliens has that extending mouth right um it's it's fully expressed in in all of mega man's weapons oh. does that make sense is it like yeah. phallic or something no maybe uh not. sometimes <laughs> they, where is your head at <laughs> oh, sometimes sometimes okay. certain tools are phallic it's true mm -hmm. um if you're talking about the, if we're talking about the entire head of mm -hmm. of the uh, the xenomorph from aliens, that's certainly phallic. Um, and if we're if we're talking about if we're talking about what the archetype is, it, it's it's man, it's this giant death rape machine. It's it's yeah, exactly it's terrifying. Uh -huh. So uh, at the very end, we get S, and that that stands for silhouette. Now silhouette mm. 
you know, a lot of a lot of teachers and a lot of people will, will start with silhouette. You know, you know how you you know a lot of people tell you, oh, do a, a bunch of um, ink blots basically on a yeah, piece yeah. of paper, like fifty ink blots, um, and find the coolest one, and then that cool one we're going to develop. Now, that's not a really good way to do production because it doesn't take into account any of the things that we talked about: form follows function, archetype, all that stuff. And what you'll end up with is something that is like either forgettable or not functional for the modeler and the animator, right? Mm. So intention before invention. You should be thinking about the things that you're creating before you start creating. It's not the other way around, right? So, um, and the other thing is 50% of silhouette is animation. The posing is, look, what would Chun-Li be if Chun-Li wasn't doing her poses for either the lightning leg or the spinning bird kick? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's like half her character right there. Right? Yeah. yeah. Like that's like true. imagine look if 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 Dante walked around all the time like a K pop girl, it just com- that's a different silhouette than than you know what yeah, he currently is. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's very different. So these are the kind of like the base things that uh, I talk about. And, you know, if you ever take a class with me, we'll really dig into it, especially work, you know, looking in, into your own, uh, <clears throat> or sorry, critiquing your work to, to, mm-hmm. to bring out the best and that sort of stuff. So today we're going to maybe <clears throat> do a sketch of, of an alien creature or, or maybe another, a bounty hunter that might exist in um, a show like The Mandalorian, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so w- one of the first things that you need to do <clears throat> is... is start off with like the idea of uh the archetype so if if i think of like um uh, if i think in my head veteran uh bounty hunter right uh, yep. that's kind of an ish, initial thought in terms of trying to figure out where i'm going to go in terms of direction right so um what does that mean right mm-hmm you could think about it. It could be a guy with some scars. It could be um, a a dude that's just older. Uh, One of the things that I want to think about is I wanted to have a very physical, uh, like a a great Mm. physical difference between the character that I'm designing and the character that it might be standing next to. Like if it, if this character is going to be standing next to the Mandalorian and kind of um, might be even his rival, I might go, opposite of what i see the mandalorian being right which is in a way of an every man because he's got a mask and you can it could be anybody underneath that mask right yeah so in this case one i'm going to be specific and and he has a medium build so i can either go thinner or bigger than him so maybe i'm thinking i want to make a tough guy so the first thing that i do mm-hmm. is uh you know normally i would you know, we're talking about silhouette explorations. Normally, I might do four or five sketches, very different sketches, mm-hmm. rather than, um, you know, that, that explores really different types, um, rather than like a, a very a bunch of variations of very similar things. But it, for the purposes of this this uh, this stream, um, I, I want to flesh out a, a single idea, um, you know. Uh, much more clearly than doing a bunch of little sketches. And, and that's just for the purpose of this, this stream. One of the things that I might be thinking about is like, okay, I, w- I want a guy that's bigger than, uh, than the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I might have, like, I might start off with a roughly human-shaped head, but, you know, we, we might evolve way past that. One of the things about uh, Star Wars is that, that they have kind of things at a human scale, right? Yeah. So that... Um, we get really quickly into the storytelling and kind of like not be overly uh, connected to the weirdness, right? So here it, you see, I'm, I'm doing these, this head and I'm, I'm finding where the uh, pit of the neck is and it, it's roughly human. It's almost like a gorilla, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see right. I'm yeah. creating like kind of, kind of this diamond shape, mm-hmm. upside yeah. down diamond when you're looking at that stuff and here's pectoral muscles. Um, and and this is just to jot down some of my ideas, right? And I could go a, a, a bit more alien with this, and that's possible. But um, 
uh, in a lot of ways, uh, Star Wars is a space fantasy rather than science fiction. So um, what you want to do is kind of create relatable characters immediately so that the audience can jump right into the story and not be f particularly focused on the weirdness of the thing that they're looking at. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't yeah. mean you shouldn't do something surprising, right? Yeah. So, um, oh, oops. So you might have kind of like this, this, this initial <laughs> outside shape. Um, but then one of the things that I'm thinking about, well, you know, maybe it's this giant rhino, uh, but rhino already exists in Spider-Man. Um, yeah. so, uh, but I, I want to have that rhino feeling. So maybe, um, you think of a rhinoceros beetle. Okay. Well, uh, that, that's, Does beetles that tend to look, yeah, they, they look sort of heavy and kind of armored and, and maybe mm -hmm. we'll go yeah. in that direction a little bit. Um. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create sort of a little lump towards the front here. And already when I do that, it, it, it's like um, it starts setting, setting things up, right? And maybe small eyes. You know, because large eyes, large eyes have a tendency to make things look younger or smaller. Yeah, and cuter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because the eyes have, a, have mm -hmm. tend to be, the bigger a creature is, the smaller their eyes tend to be in relationship to the rest of their body. And there's mm -hmm. only really one exception to that. And that's the giant squid. Giant squid, yeah. Yeah. Giant squid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there's a, there's a term called neoteny, which is like the, how certain adult forms might have childlike, um, a, a childlike appearance. Features. Um, yeah. 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 So, so, We've done that with dogs. Um, you know, the, we we've bred them to have that kind of quality because it's it's cute. Because we yeah. we uh, we react to that. Yeah. Um, now the reason for for let's see if the mouth maybe up here. So already, even in these few strokes, right? And we've been only working on this for maybe four minutes and stuff like that. Um, you're already starting to feel and are happening like this big heavy. Uh, bounty hunting goon, right? Which is very different from the IG88, but um, mm. or IG11, I guess on the on the show. But when we're talking about neoteny, um, there, there's another term that's related to it, moi. You guys know what moi is? Mm, no, I'm not familiar with uh, it. So if if you're if you're totally into Japanese anime, into Japanese stuff, uh, moi is a Japanese word there. that means the unreasonable need mm -hmm. to take care of something cute. Okay. Ah. You know, okay. M O E in in English, but moe. Moe. Um, okay. And they use it a lot in Japanese marketing. So it's like even when we're, when we're talking about the you know the imoto kind of like the little sister taking care of the little sister kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. all these cute characters that we have. Um, uh, I guess a good ver like a good under understanding of it would be like um, Pokemon. Mm. Pokemon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything there is like really cute, and mm -hmm. um, so you know you got to understand that that kind of terminology and understand what uh, what that really means because Pokemon's the biggest IP in the world. Yeah, now, it beats out everything. It beats out Star Wars. It beats out uh, Marvel. Do you guys have any idea what number two is? Disney. Uh, nah. No, no, don't don't say like it. Like the Disney princesses, you mean? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like don't even the it. Disney princesses as a whole. Uh, <laughs> I think there, there's something around the Disney princess line is something maybe around the mm, twenty billion or thirty billion dollar mark. Um, so uh, for example, um, what do you call it? Um, Pokemon is at. I want to say eighty-five billion dollars. Oh my god! Ooh. And then number two at around eighty or, or, or maybe eighty-two is uh, Hello Marvel? Kitty. Hello Kitty. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, no. Marvel is Marvel is around thirty-five. Wow. Mm. Japanese people. <laughs> I mean, Pokemon. Boy, is like it, it's 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 because it's really universal, right? Mm -hmm. That's that not definitely not the thing that we're doing here. So here I'm, I'm just <laughs> yeah, definitely not more. <laughs> just trying to crank out these shapes. Um, 
And so the, what you're not seeing here a lot is the, the construction lines, uh, although you'll see me just put in a couple. Um, it's because my, my brain is already doing that stuff. Um, it, and if I were teaching, teaching people and we were really digging into this, I, I would really show you the construction lines um, so that you can understand that all of this stuff is grounded in fundamentals. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you don't have the fundamentals, you're going to come up with a task that you have no solution for and you're just yeah. going to melt. Yes. You're going to melt, right? Yeah. Absolutely. If you even make your way into the industry for some some lucky reason because you did a you know a really cool couple of illustrations and people think you're you know um mm -hmm. you managed to flim flam some professionals that, that <laughs> you're actually good at stuff once you're sitting in the studio and working for these people and then you're asked you're tasked with a problem that you have zero solutions for you're gonna get melted i've seen this all the time mm -hmm. um it was particularly tough when i was working in the movie industry because in the movie industry back in the day Mm -hmm. You only had a couple, couple days to really prove uh, whether or not you were worthy, and um, you know, <laughs> if you didn't, then they would just let you go. Okay. But did they pay you for the like for the amount of time that you for, for the three there? days or the two days that you were there? Yeah, sure. Oh, damn. Right. I mean that. I mean that happens certainly, but at the same time, it's just kind of like, well, mm -hmm. you know, game over. Bye. Well, do, do you know? And then you'll get a reputation. Mm. Really? I mean, do you know anyone who's like really successful right now who were let let go back then? You know, working on a nope. movie. Oh nope. shoot! Oh my gosh! Nope. <laughs> that is tough. They're, they disappeared. <laughs> oh my god! You know, they they just you know like that's the thing. Okay, so um, we're sort of pushing this archetype, you know, the, the little sort of the, mm -hmm. the beetle thing. Um, I'm trying to decide whether or not I should have huge mandibles on this. Or just smaller ones, mm -hmm. and and right now as I'm doing this, the smaller things, it's it's reminding me of a uh, the sulfagid, um, which is the the camel spider. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was gonna do these large kind of decorative stuff, but I realized, oh well, maybe I'm starting to think about the set. <laughs> you know, like if he's inside a bar, he might <laughs> bump into a bunch of things, and I don't want that happening. Find some other way to 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 show. Um, the, so, the... so as you're doing this, you're actually like uh, thinking so much about the where he is, or yeah, his yeah, environment, uh, how he sits I, there. I think, yeah, I think about those things, um, but I don't try. To, I I want to try to experiment with with crazy stuff too. It's better to pull yourself back than it is from from doing like it's better to try something awesome and then pull yourself back than not try something awesome and end up with something that's boring and, and kind of generic, right? Um, mm. So, you know, let's see. Let's have like a little kind of little frill thing here. But already you guys can you can see the, the personality coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. Daniel's um, up already? Uh -huh. yeah, he he thought it's um 11 p.m. LA time. Oh. Oh, oh but yeah, he's already here. Uh, there you so, go. Wait, wait <laughs> nice, 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 nice. Nice, nice. So we got started. So we're ten minutes into this drawing, really. <laughs> um. Well, when when would we start? We like eight. I guess it's twenty minutes because I was talking a bit. Um. Yeah. So now I'm I'm kind of. You know, working on the shapes and seeing where I can um, play with the anatomy a little bit. Now, I have to ask myself, is this going to be a suit or is it going to be a full CG character? Now, if it's a full CG character, mm -hmm. I can mess around <laughs> with the anatomy a lot more. But here, let's, I'm just going to do a bust. Um, and, you know, for, for the sake of the production and, and making sure that, um, you know, it, it is... It has that Star Wars feeling, like the classic Star Wars yeah. feeling. Not, not, not necessarily the prequels, but um, more the, the the original movies from the early 80s and 70s. <laughs> uh, I might go, hey, let's do a suit, right? If it's a suit, then um, I have to I have to understand how a person might fit in here, yeah. right? Um, and so I'm going to keep the anatomy relatively. 
relatively, relatively like, humanoid. Yeah. yeah, humanoid, right? Um, and here I'm, I'm thinning out the front part of the jaw a little bit so that I have room for these uh, these mandibles here. It's starting to take shape. I can already imagine. <clears throat> and then maybe we, we can add a, <clears throat> another set of eyes and kind of push the spider-like quality of it a little bit. Carlo, I do have like a, a question. Mm. While you do uh, this character, do you have, um, do you imagine it in 3D space? Like, how do you? All the time. That's why I draw and don't push paint. Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, any uh, truly, um, like, memorable character, most of the memorable characters that have been mm -hmm. made are uh, something that was drawn or sculpted rather than someone where you know, you know, you've seen some of these artists where their process is like they're, you know, they do blobs and then they, they start pushing the paint around it and, and mm -hmm. sort of finish the illustration. Um, that can work for environment. Um, I don't often see that working for, for character because like um, with when you're drawing through like I'm doing right now, I'm really pushing the space. So if I, if I make a, a new layer right here and um, kind of give you guys... You know, if we if we are talking about the construction, you can you can see that I'm already, I've have I have it in perspective, right? There's, there's like, even though I haven't drawn the things in, you can see that I've, I've you know I'm, I'm pushing that this thing in 3D space, yeah. And then there's, there's volumes to the neck, and then there's volumes to the arm, and the volumes either going towards you or going away from you. For example, the rear arm back here might be going away, right? And the front arm might be going towards, right? The cylinder going towards you. Uh, the torso is going away from you, right? Yeah. And, and then, and it's the same thing with the head. The head is also going away from you because you're below it. And subconsciously, already, I was like drawing it uh, from a point of view of having to look up at this guy. Mm -hmm. So you know, even though I, you don't have anything else inside, uh, inside this drawing, the, mm -hmm. the, the um, position that I've done it in is already giving you a sense of scale without having any reference points. And the only reference reference point you have right now is just kind of your POV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's go jump into to this thing. You know, and one of the, here's one of the little funny things: just creating creating these little um, uh, antenna right here, almost like a small moth like antenna, is is yeah. like the little little funny thing. Like this is the little weird thing, right? Uh, the thing that makes this yeah. kind of go away from here. Here's characterization. You know, this goes away from the trope, um, and so. It's a way for the character to express themselves, too. So, like, say he doesn't like your plan, those two little things might be vibrating a lot, <laughs> right? Or mm. they could go up, or if he's sad, they could go down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So creating opportunities for, for, for character, for expression, that's characterization. Mm, I see. Okay. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> one of the things that I might be doing like a, say i i want to start painting this right um yeah let's i'm gonna duplicate it real quick um uh, normally normally uh i would clean up this line work right uh and then i would start painting right but right now we're on a quick stream and i really want to get to some of your questions so uh, i'm just going to jump in there and paint this uh here i'm going to create a multiply layer and then underneath that means all the white stuff can can be seen through um, underneath, I'm going to just start painting, right? So let's grab a palette for ourselves. Let's see. Let me find an image. Now you can give yourself um, um, like use traditional palettes like the Zorn palette or a bunch of other things or, or mm. um, uh, you know, come up with a color theory and a little color wheel for yourself and, and, and do that. Uh, but what we're going to do, uh, let's see, let's see if I can find a good picture, um, is grab a photograph mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a living creature and kind of mm -hmm. use the colors on something like that, right? 
Now, um, I don't want this guy particularly brightly colored, um, but I want him to be interesting. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll use a locust. I'm going to pa paste the locust real quick right here. And you see him right there. Well, what, I, what I'm going to use this for is I'm going to use him as a uh, as my palette, right? And you can see kind of this pale, uh, fleshy tone. It's funny. I'm looking at this. This locust is actually a Zorn palette. <laughs> hmm. It's actually using the Zorn palette. So the Zorn palette uses gray and a bunch of warms, yeah. right? And it's it's relatively a s simple thing, and it, and it works really well. Um, it's named after Andrew Zorn, who's an amazing, amazing uh, watercolorist. Uh, and some of his like uh, water-based, uh, sorry, uh, paintings look like they're oil. <clears throat> so, just to, just for my own personal vanity, I'm going to use this gray right here, which I found in the background. And it's sort of a cool gray. I'm going to use that as uh, like this background, and so that I can see what I'm doing a little bit clearer. And then we'll go right back to this. And what I'm doing right now is I'm for I'm just doing really flat color, right? And the reason why I'm doing it this way is that this, this is going to function as my layer mask, as well as my base colors. You know? Um, and so to make it easier for you guys too, um, I'm although I'm gonna use color, I'm gonna treat this monochromatically for now so that you guys can see uh, uh, shadow and form. Cause really yeah. rendering or oh. <laughs> what some people call shading. Um, is Daniel in? Oh yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hey, you can do, you guys can do like a little quick introduction and then while I... Okay, so guys, um, we have our uh, second guest speaker who is a principal artist for Sony Interactive Entertainment, which is Danielle Kabuko. He designed um, Soul Reaver, if you, if you remember Soul Reaver, especially. Yeah, with... big fan, big fan, honestly. <laughs> I grew up with that game, so yeah. Hi, Danielle, say hi. <laughs> Hi, I just want to say, how's it going? <laughs> Welcome, my guy. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's so honor to be here. Doing a demo. Thank you for having me. Carly's just doing a demo on a on a locust or a Wida, you know, Wida character. <laughs> awesome. So right now, um, the the thing I'm I'm, I'm doing is I'm just. Uh, almost doing um, an ambient occlusion pass, um, and that's because I'm I'm picturing this this guy um, like inside inside of a bar, and there might be some lights overhead, but there's going to be like a lot of bounce off of that light. And um, oddly enough, right now for this solution, because I'm looking for something that uh, will deliver me uh, uh, a relatively moody image of this dude. Um, I'm doing the bounce light stuff first. So when, when I'm doing that too, one of the things that I'm being conscious about is, uh, you know, how I'm going to handle the edges. And although I'm re doing it really soft right now, because this is digital, I have the opportunity to go in there and really, hard, you know, create hard um, hard lines, which is not yeah, not the way I would do it with traditional. Like with traditional, especially if you're using gouache. Um, uh, I would be much more conscious about uh, yeah, my, my yeah. edges. And what I do is I'll be laying things, uh, um, you know, laying colors next to, to each other rather than um, doing what I'm doing right now, which is yeah. blending and doing that at the same time. Yeah, you think about um, it more. Yeah, yeah. It's like the tiling method. Um, but here, I, I'm not. Well, I'm really thinking about, like, you know, what, what areas are, are darkest and and um you know where where light is not escaping that those areas and kind of putting that in and you can see how i'm quickly getting form this is almost like uh doing a matte cap shader in 3d mm. um so 
really finding where those those areas are, right? And then I can go go in here. Um, and one of the things that I do is I think about um, how say 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 the general shape of where the light is coming from is 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 from the front, even though it's 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 an ambient occlusion. It's really a form of bounce light that's that's lighting this thing. Um, here uh, on the temple, that's going to be farther back, right? And then I think to myself, okay, let's talk about edges now. As if it's being lit a little bit to the front. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And you guys can see the screen all right? Yes. Okay. See, yeah, actually, this kind of is reminiscent of watercolor or um, marker rendering as well. That's right. If you look at traditional methodologies, as opposed to like acrylic or opaque media, building up shapes and form and looking at really like you know the shape of a cylinder or the shape of a of a, of a ball and feeling it how it moves through the character. It's like a yes. form like form shadows and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're not really more like cast shadows unless you're doing a mood piece. It's more like just to get the form to shape mm -hmm. down. And what I like about this uh, Carlos design right now is that he's using rough shapes and he's just really establishing what he's going for and exploring mm -hmm. the character as well in this. Mm -hmm. uh, the shapes and forms are, are, aren't you know super defined here because you know you trust your own abilities and you kind of like find the shape as well and find like what's cool about this character. Um, the rough the rough form is there, which is a nice guideline, but you're not mm -hmm. you know, you're adhering to it until you as, you, as you, you make some fun discoveries or some happy accidents as well. Right, right. Is it like at this stage, are you like, you're not very invested yet, right? Like it could change at this it could It could totally change. Uh, the only thing I'm invested in is the general idea of the character um, and, mm -hmm. and, and being able to, like if I set up a pillar for myself, which is kind of this, um, armored goon. If it, if it doesn't look like an armored goon, I kind of leave it out unless it's an opportunity for me to do unique characterization, which is like I said, the tiny little antennas over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, now I might start thinking about actual like edges and stuff like that, right? So the jawline here might be a harder edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, what happens then is because the, the the light is relatively ambient, the fall off is softer. The cast shadows might not be particularly strong in this situation, mm -hmm. right? Does it mean like um, um, the lighting is from the front, but it's just um, one lighting at the moment? I mean, just now it's just one lighting, right? Yeah, because uh, okay. I know in my head I'm already thinking there's going to be at least two, right? And the okay. two is going to be the, the second one is going to be a really strong light from overhead, um, and because I know that right already, and I'm I'm kind of confident in the way, in the way that I want to light this, uh, I'm not worried about it. Uh, what I'm worrying about is making sure that with such a soft light that I can really establish, I still establish a lot of form. Um, yeah. And uh, like for example, here this this big shoulder, it's 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 you're going to have a softer. Uh, you know, transition there. Then say this is a this this neck, although round, is faceted a little bit. Yeah. So we will have um, a, a bit of a harder edge as it's coming forward, and then a quite a quite hard. Uh, excuse me, over here, because this is a lip. You know, um, mm -hmm. like a, a stronger turn. Yeah. So you know, every time I'm doing these these sorts of things, I, you know, as you guys were saying, it's form shadows. And also, you're, you're hybridizing a bunch of different shapes together, but using the locust there as a nice re re reference for chitinous form, to or chitinous form rather. I was called chitinous chitinous form. <laughs> at uh, how you can you can hybridize those forms into something really cool, you know. And, and your shape design, Carlos, something I really love. Your your form and shape language, 
it always has these really beautiful, strong thrusts of, of you know, beautiful form and, and then beautiful details mm-hmm. as you sort of get into it, which is, you know, a lot of fun to play with. And that's that's part of what a designer has to do is find their voice and find out like what they like. And it's a lot of standing mm-hmm. on the giants. You, you learn from looking at other people and you incorporate those, a bit of this and a bit of that into your form, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your, your favorite comic book artists, your favorite designers, your favorite painters, and you start making your own designs. That's right. <clears throat> Like, uh, Carla, who are some of your influences? Who do you draw from? Well, um, early on, um, it certainly was Frank Frazetta. <laughs> yeah. Growing up, you know, you see Frank Frazetta, yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the, one of the ones that I, I didn't know his name when I was first, um, <clears throat> when I first saw his stuff, because when I was a kid and, 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 and really, it, um, I wasn't paying attention too much to that stuff, just the resting imagery, right? Um, which was, uh, uh, Nestor Redondo, um, mm-hmm. uh, the great Filipino comic book artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And that was that was because um, when I was a when I was a kid, I, I, I went to church on Easter, and um, after church there was this little kind of uh, convenience store nearby, mm-hmm. and 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 I went in there while my parents were still coming out of church, and and I saw the a comic book like Savage Sword of Conan comic book, and the cover was so just so arresting um that um that i had to buy that thing right away like me, and I, yeah <laughs> oh my god it was just it was just amazing and um you know i, I tried to copy that stuff um and certainly there was the, there was the star wars stuff although i gotta say monster movies were much more my jam when i was younger um yeah so those were my early influences and of course when i was when i started uh, going to college and, and um Although I, I was looking at comic book artists um, that they really didn't influence me that much, um, it was um, it was Muka, and you can kind of see it in my work. Like there's even even in something like this, there's certain <laughs> flows to it that that's that's very very Muka esque. Yeah. Um, so he he was a huge influence. Um, uh, can you say his full name just for the audience in case they don't know? It, Alphonse Maria Muka. Um, so, you know, that was very influential to me. And um, you know what? Uh, let's see. When it comes to the Star Wars stuff, uh, Joe Johnston. Joe Johnston was a huge influence. As yeah. well as, um, and, and now, now that, that I'm reminded by that, Ron Cobb was really big because I was constantly uh, trying to copy like the swords and things from Conan. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for sure, for sure, Ron Cobb's a big influence on me. Um, and you can see one is you'll find you have influences from for different things, like if, one for design and one for rendering and one for right. you know like different kinds of uh, elements, mood. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, you know I like Arthur Adams growing up for his oh, yeah, yeah. pose design and his his solidity of his shapes and his craftsmanship. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, you're right. There are so many like wonderful. Uh, Artists out there who have like you know an influence on us like Wills Portacio, yeah. yeah. Wills Portacio, yay! You know yeah. uh, his <laughs> he he actually uh, <clears throat> like indirectly I think is responsible for my success if I have to like mm-hmm. um, put that down is because um, and I think I told you the story before uh, when I when I was in college. Um, uh, there was a, a comic book convention uh, from uh, b- basically the first one in the Philippines, right? From uh, mm-hmm. Finbars. And Phil Bars. Phil Bars. Yeah. There you go. Phil Bars. I keep fucking that up. It's still but, alive. Um, <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, till today. Yeah. Till today. Yeah. So, because I used to go to the original store in Cubao. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he, he had he had Wilts there. And, you know, suddenly they, they, they were doing this kind of like uh, art contest. And I didn't, I didn't participate, right? Or whether like maybe I was playing too much Street Fighter or playing too much basketball or some, <laughs> yeah. something stupid yeah. like that. And uh, when I went there, um, I saw so much really good artwork from from a, from a bunch of people. Um, and the the art contest, um, uh, the guy who won was Nick Manabat. Nick Manabat. You know? Yeah, Manabat. He was no longer with us. Like he he passed away from cancer um, mm. shortly after winning that actually, 
So he won, but it was funny because he was wearing the same shirt I was wearing. And I was like, oh my God, that could have been me. Like I was sitting there going like, but I didn't do anything, you know? And, <laughs> you know, from then on, I, 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 was, I was going like, anytime there was a challenge in front of me or something that's like an opportunity, I was not gonna let that pass. You know, I was really so angry at myself uh, for that sort of stuff. Um, and, 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 oh, by the way, I'm using a little bit of red here to imply some, some subsurface scattering and, and just kind of like mm -hmm. getting a little bit of the variance going on here. Um, I'm hoping um, to wrap Can you up. tell us about uh, where you are in the principle of design you mentioned a while ago, like from the abbreviation facts? Right, right. So um, right now, like I established a lot of it already. Like it happens very mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. So form follows function. He's so here's here's this big goon who's who's a bounty hunter, right? Yeah. Um, and I haven't even designed his costuming. That that, that can be pushed. Uh, in terms of characterization, like like I said, um, I did these little antennas, right? And his mm -hmm. tools are his physical size. But after we we go through it, I might give him kind of uh, you know these gloves that are stun. Stun mm. gauntlets or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, And then um, already, because I'm thinking about all those things, where, you know, form follows function, characterization, archetype. Mm. Um, it has generated for me, uh, like, the general personality of what this character is, <laughs> right? Mm. So, so the, the, do you think about it in a, uh, like, in a whole, as a whole? Or do well, you, like, really do it step by step, like... It's my North Star. Mm. It's not a step by step. It's just a tool. You know, it's a checklist, right? Because mm. really, the, the, the design part is, is a very organic process that's based yeah. off of your education and a lot of your background, right? The mm. things, you know, when, when Daniel said, you know, who are your influences? It, it's, it's also like a catalog of your influences as, as, as far as this stuff is going. And you can see at least this guy has kind mm. of the round, chunky shape, shapes that, um, you might find in, um, ooh, I like that red, that you might find. Cheeks. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> in, in someone like, say, Richard Corbin. Yes, definitely. This is, sorry, give, give, this is a very Richard Corbin kind of like shape here, like uh, all the stuff that's happening right now. And it's not something that I was thinking about consciously, but when I when I uh, think about it, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm really, where the folds are, that's where I'm really hitting it up with the ambient occlusion. So it's, this is not one of those like dramatic lighting form shadow kind of stuff. It, it's really um, flowing around the forms. Although there's, there's a, there is a location of that light that you know, this, this bounce light is really in front. But, but yeah, like, um, you know, uh, along with that, you know, a lot of those guys kind of had a round uh, or chunky sensibility, even Ron Cobb. Yeah. Uh, if you guys so it's kind of like, uh, what do you call that? Second nature or like subconsciously from your influences. It just, you know, comes out yeah. through your art. Yeah. 100%. 100%. You know, maybe these really dark eyes. No pupils. Are Tyler, you used uh, to uh, read Heavy Metal magazine? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Holy shit. Yeah. yeah um, you know, we were talking about Corbin. There's also like uh, Mobius. Mobius, um, yeah. Yeah. So Mobius, for example, um, I don't think I was like, I, I wasn't influenced as much about his forms as I was heavily influenced about his methodology because he has a tendency to remix a lot of things. And um, you know, since we're such a global culture nowadays, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of multicultural influences. Uh, on people's work now, but back then only Mobius really was doing it, um, mm. where he was mixing cowboy with, uh, y you know, a, a wuxia kind of hero, right? Like um, yeah. with the coolie hat and, and things like that. If you look at his designs on um, on Willow, you can see a lot of, of those influences happening. That's right, man. Yeah, that's love, really his, love his design sensibilities where he would you know, like you said, space cowboy or dragon oh, cowboy, yeah. kind of. A yeah. Thing. Oh my god. Yeah, for sure. You would roll those dice and you make it work, and you'd be like, "How?" Yeah. Good. Oh, how yeah, good yeah. You are. That's crazy. But at the same time, it's it's like uh, you know maybe multiple of the archetypes that he's he's working on has the um, uh, <laughs> the 
similar cultural aesthetics, right? Yeah. Like a warrior is a warrior, no matter what what culture like, we're talking about. Kind of messy. So, yeah. So if you if you take something like um uh, a oh what do you call what do you call those guys in Africa that that hunt lions? Uh, Maasai. The, the, yeah, the, the Maasai. If you take a Maasai and you, you and you mix it with the Lone Ranger, it's it's a real easy thing to do because the the lanky kind of Clint Eastwood um, cowboy shape um, is also found in uh, a Maasai, mm. and they're very beautiful. I mean, like um, physically, their 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 body shape's almost elven, right? So yeah, dark elven. It, yeah, it's so so easy to do that stuff. It's actually a good idea, you know, um, make elves uh, who lives in the savanna. Uh -huh. that, would, that would be new. <laughs> that would be something new, or like elves who live in the desert. Of the yeah, yeah. And then be true to your archetype, right? And 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 don't don't get caught up in, in kind of like the political mess of what it, whatever is happening, and, and don't have like um, you know draw what you love, and and, and don't get too stuck on, on to thinking about what your, the perception of any particular thing is. Mm. Like, for example, I, des I designed this character, Rona. Uh, that's funny, her name's Rona. Um, uh, for, for Vainglory, and she was this barbarian character, right? Yeah. And so when I did her, like, she's not really wearing any armor. She's kind of wearing, like, a, a bit of a halter top, and then it's kind of like this short. <laughs> yeah. um, this well, I mean, sexy. yeah. <laughs> And, and then she even had she had the scars on her mm -hmm. on her uh, stomach because I was like looking at Bruce Lee the way um, he looked like in Enter the Dragon, right? Because um, yeah, he yeah, has yeah. Those, those things, and I was doing that. And then someone wrote an article online that evisceration is not funny, uh, and going like, you know, here's this here's this design for this character, and um, um, you know, she's she's if she's a warrior, then why isn't she wearing armor? And, mm -hmm. and it's not like well because it's it's a barbarian <laughs> character. I didn't I didn't draw a knight. If I was doing Joan of Arc, I was doing Joan of Arc. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and you know the Celts fought naked, and um, I even had somebody at work like sort of get on get on my case about it. I'm like, dude, I mean, like, she, she she went up to me and went, "That's not a very practical design. This is really sexist." And I'm all like, I, I was basing it off of Bruce Lee. How much? Oh, how much? <laughs> you know. And, and he's like shirtless, right? And how, how much, <laughs> how much more do you want? And 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 the girl that I designed, like you know, she was really she was a barbarian, basically. She was a barbarian, <laughs> and she was very muscular. Um, and and I'm gonna merge this down real quick because I, I want. To well, I think there are also different approaches to what people consider um, a skilled warrior. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Certain mm, have yeah. more armor, like uh, you know, certain like knights and stuff like that would have certain yeah, yeah. thicker armor. Well. In certain Eastern cultures, having less meant you were more skilled. It meant you were so badass you didn't need it. You know? Well, and that's kind of where I turned the conversation, right? Because like she was on top of me about all of this stuff, and I, and I went look, and I told her she was. She tried to accuse me of being sexist, and I yeah. told her she was being racist. <laughs> so, and I'm all like, my people killed Magellan practically naked, and he was in full armor. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, that's what I said to her. I'm all like. <laughs> Okay. Right? Protect the necks, you know, the, the yeah, I, like he he was in that guy was in full conquistador harness, and an old man killed him. Yeah, and he was practically lapu lapu. We have this amazing like statue of him, but yeah. honestly, at that time when he met when he met Magellan, that dude was old. Yeah, he was. Lapu lapu is old. Oh my god. Yeah, when he when he when he fought Magellan, he was an old man. But um, you know, we have a history of dangerous old men and women. <laughs> well, I think that's um, part of the thing is you have to have that that understanding, that deep understanding of of, of what constitutes uh, warrior and armor and stuff like that. And sometimes you don't have time to give people an education about like what what it is you're drawing from because they're not part of the actual uh, audience you're painting to. They're just yeah. kind of like, and so you have to understand like, their their limited understanding of it is sometimes going to get in the way while you're trying to make a statement to yeah. your, your core audience, which is like your art director, your producers, the people who are going to be, you know, the stakeholders who understand that stuff too. Like if you're talking to the creative director, I mean, most likely they have a deep understanding of it too. And they understand where you're drawing from. That's why you're their art director or you're their artist. Whereas people who are parallel who don't understand it have a, a, a less deep understanding, you know, 
you don't have time to educate them. You don't have time to, you, you, you can tell them to look it up, but honestly, that your job isn't to educate them. Your job is to get the, the work done. That's right. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. And you, you can you can give them a you know a small thing like your state parallel. It's like, hey, you know, in, in Asia, uh, you know, being more skilled means less harm. You know, it's like, or you know, look at three hundred. Yeah, sure. Maybe like that much permanent. Particularly so, Southeast yeah, Asia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Particularly exactly. Southeast Asia. Like, it's, it's, that's yeah, not to say we didn't. Yeah, that's not to say we didn't have heavy armor. Because if you look at the moto armor from from back then, we were wearing chainmail. Yeah. Uh, we had, you know, it, it was it was quite like articulate stuff. But you know, if we're talking about a tribal peoples, and especially if your archetype is barbarian, that's not that's not the thing that you're going to be doing. Yep, absolutely yeah. not. <clears throat> but it's a it's a definitely a fun discussion to have with your friends. And <laughs> one, some of the best stuff you can do when you're given a, an assignment is to go do some research. You know, look at different armors. You learn so much just doing the research. Oh, I love I love research. See, now, now as I pop the light in, like the if I, I'm imagining the bar lights behind him, you can yeah. see that suddenly, <clears throat> holy shit, there's an illustration and it's like yeah, magic, it, right? Yeah, it's like magic. Oh my god, it's a three D form now. There you go. And again, part of what what you're doing is understanding like who you're making this for when you make this kind of art. It's like you know, this mm -hmm. isn't this isn't the layout art you're going to give to the three D artist. This is mm -hmm. going to be like the idea stuff where you're trying to sell sell the idea of this creature. That's right. To, uh, you know, your stakeholders, or you know, for your own personal illustration. But if it, this is a, if this is production work, this would be considered something that would be for for a new piece or for a uh, yeah. Yeah. So something like this, um, as we're getting to it, if I wasn't talking, it would be it would be even faster. It's something that would take me about thirty minutes, right? Yeah, um, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, roughly. So uh, I would do several of these, say before lunch, um, and you know, right after lunch, um, I'd have uh, the stakeholders, whether it's it's, it's the art director, or uh, in the case of if I'm the art director and I'm, I'm and I'm going to show this to somebody, maybe the creative director, and I'll see him show him a series of these things. You know, I might have like four or five done, you know, in the morning. And then I go, hey, let's take a look at some of these sketches. And it has to be kind of put together enough so that you're um, effectively expressing uh, the design that you want to, or, or the uh, story behind the design. Mm. Um, so that he has something, to, he or she has something to look at. Uh, and, and then... Um, we pick one, and I'll develop that one uh, for the rest of the afternoon, and then we have another conversation the following day. Mm -hmm. so that, that would be the purpose of something like this. Is it this rough, or um, is it is it um, really tight, or you know? If how how loose who, do you yeah, give the? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to Daniel's point of view, it depends on who, who your audience is and who you're talking to. If there's mm -hmm. somebody that really understands um, what you're doing, because, like, for example, even this is relatively loose, but you, yeah, the story's there. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? But yeah. uh, at the same time, you've seen my paintings. I can get pretty yeah. tight on stuff. Yeah. And that usually takes me anywhere between one or two days to do. <clears throat> um, and yeah. To, to, to also that point is to understand that. The relationship between the artist and the art director is usually well established. Um, mm -hmm. But for example, if I were to hire Carlo to do a design, I would know he could do all these incredibly, incredibly deep renderings. But I also would hire him for his design sensibilities. So what I'd be looking mm -hmm. for at this stage would be his design sensibilities and a deep trust and understanding that he could take this to an actual finish if we wanted him to. But we need the ideas. You know, you need a lot of ideas. The rapid ideas, uh, rapid vid is something that's you know important. Uh, being able to lay down those ideas and have a, a shorthand between the artist and the art director. And go, I like this the way this is going, let's do this. Or if, you know, we tell the stakeholders like, oh, we don't like insect faces. We want, you know, we want rhino faces. You know, okay, well, hey, Carlo, you know, let's make this guy more organic in the in the plating or something like that. We wouldn't we wouldn't take it too far down because again, you can't get too married to this stuff when you're doing designs for games or for movies or things like that. I mean That's you might finish this later too if you if you like the design, you you know, you're yeah, finished absolutely. It up and you can come back to it. So and see that. That's all I want to do, but if your audience is again like you know your 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 fan base or something like that, or if you're going for like finish illustration, then you take us much further. And you know who cares? It's it's my idea, my design. I can do whatever I want. That's right. I can do as far as I want. Um, yeah, and and it, and there's easy ways to sort of create volume. You know, like for example, I can really um, so if I copy it, I uh, go image adjust brightness and contrast. I just take the brightness down just a little bit. Okay, and then. Grab an eraser. Uh, 
But they actually said, I love you, Carlo. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Me. I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone from the Philippines actually. No, kung may mga fans pala kami. <laughs> but it's actually male, so um, don't give your hopes up. <laughs> Dude, have you seen my lady? I, I am not looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, there's a question from Eli Katubak. He said that if he's gonna design a character, and uh, does he have to draw down? I mean. Does he have to put all these ideas down, you know, just get it shot, sketch it out, or does he have to go straight to rendered on fiction and, you know, much of it while ago? Um, it depends on the process. It depends who you're, you're dealing with. Like, for example, if if you're, you know, doing the sort of the process that I'm talking about, um, it, it's nice to have multiple ideas to show them so that they have options, right? Uh, but the, it depends on your abilities because honestly, Ian McKegg can jump in and do a, a really like involved drawing in a very short amount of time. Um, so, you know, what what his his version of a sketch, though, for example, might be sketchy. It's it, it's still so beautiful that it it looks you know really um, well thought out. Um, but for the most part, if if I'm say say I'm dealing with a, an experienced um, art director like Daniel. Um, with him, this this is this is kind of the thing that I might be delivering for that. Like I said, that uh, post lunch meeting, right? And, and so that we can have a, a conversation. And, yeah. and he knows that uh, once we choose something, that we're gonna we're gonna do a much more um, the word involved is not the word I'm looking for. Uh, much more rendered piece for mm -hmm. the the Friday meeting with the the creative director or the CEO or whatever. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have that done, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, like, there's different. There's no single rule for it, and that's why you you'll hear us multiple times. It's it's not about rules. It's about tools. You know, you develop yeah. a, a toolbox that allows you to solve uh, you know pro you know different kinds of production problems. Right. This is not the technical drawing, but this is the one that's that um, I use in order to get people to understand my ideas but you have to be good enough so that the stuff that you do is still convincing right right that answers the question uh, there's so definitely a short term that has to be set up but if you if you also have to be good enough to be able to make your ideas uh heard you know mm -hmm. for sure for sure and that, that's why one reason i love working with carlo and that you're just you know you're talking about this stuff is because we have a short hand mm -hmm. yeah so we, you know, even movie short hair, movie reference short hair, you know? Oh, yeah. And you're like, okay, I know what you're talking about. Or, you, yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. You, know, you can you can say a little a little more minotaur, a little, you know. So um, as I'm going to go through this, I'm going to address some of the questions that people um, yeah, yeah, I was sent, about sent to last ask. night. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, they asked is, is like, do I still go by Chainsaw Droid? Chainsaw Droid was just me because I couldn't get Chainsaw. <laughs> Um, that's why I was using that for the for the blog. But to be honest with you, the reason why uh, I got I got the nickname Chainsaw when I first started working um, at a place called Media Dawn um, because I was I was fast um, and um, the two two reasons one I was fast two I was I was doing a lot of full contact Filipino martial arts. Um, oh, let me elaborate on that. Um, so. There's a there's a group here in the United States called the Dog Brothers, and they do full contact uh, arnis with no armor. Um, so the lightning kid or the sorry the uh, lightning scientific guys over in the Philippines do that too. There's there's a, a couple of really good groups uh, in in Manila that that do full contact stick fighting without armor. You know, not the weak ass stuff. So <laughs> I, I was doing a lot of that stuff. Um, you can see I'm doing some of the skin patterns here. To to make him look uh, a little a little more dangerous, almost tiger like. Um, I was doing a lot of that stuff while I was uh, working over at uh, Ready at Dawn, and the other thing that I was doing was I was really good at uh, making the schedule go faster. Um, now the the reason why I got called Chainsaw was that one I was cutting the schedule, and two I had a lot of knives. 
<laughs> so this 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 uh, kind of East Coast Italian dude that I was working with named Tony mm -hmm. was like uh, in the middle of a meeting and said, oh, well, you know, we'll get this done if Chainsaw over here does it. And so <laughs> after that, everyone started calling me Chainsaw. And that's why I got that nickname. One of the other things uh, that, that was asked is, um, you know, what do I think about the growing Filipino art industry? So mm -hmm. let's be specific. The growing Filipino uh, video game art industry is what's happening right now because the the uh, Filipino art industry has always like existed, right? Um, you know, from the comic book artists back in the World War II and and before, and the comic book artists that came here during the 1970s working on things like Swamp Thing and and Savage Sword of Conan and even Spider Man, right? Like uh, that that group is uh, Floro Derry who who designed uh, a bunch of things for um, G.I. Joe and, and uh, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Transformers, the original Transformers was designed by a Filipino. There you go. Yeah. Um, and we talked about uh, Emilio Rodas Gennaro who, who designed the original Mandalorian armor as well as Slave One. We've talked about that a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's always been there. Like whether we're talking about Disney or, uh, you know, like in my case, uh, working on 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 movies and, and World of Warcraft, um, and, and Daniel obviously working on um, Soul Reaver, you know it's it's always been there, Ooh, and yeah. I think it's great now. Uh, and and I know that sometimes when I work with companies, mm -hmm. I've I've asked for Filipino artists by name, um, like um, um, when I was working on uh, mm -hmm. over at Machine Zone, um, there was a an outsource studio called um, Section Studios or System, and um, you know, I remember they they had just hired uh, uh, Dimayuga, and mm. I was like, okay, I'll give you I'll give you guys my business if I can have Dimayuga. <laughs> oh, shout out to Jay Z. Shout out to Jay Z. Hope you're yeah, watching yes. too. <laughs> so like you know. I, I've, I've had the when when I get it when I get the opportunities and 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 it's, and I, I see that there's a person um, that is uh, appropriate to the particular project that I'm working on, like um, you know I, I'll I'll ask for it by name. All right, and number three, do I have any interest in returning some days and working there? Uh, yeah, obviously. Like uh, I I would love to come back. Uh, maybe at post COVID, we we can have a proper. Um, like a real seminar where I can spend maybe three hours on the design and then really, uh, if we do like a multi-day seminar, we can even have students yeah, that stick great. around and, and then I can go through their portfolios and, and their designs and kind of like give them a bunch of critiques and tips and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, it, number four, how did I get where I was at? Because usually it's a dream for Pinoy's like me, especially during that era when Blizzard was ar arguably in its prime. How did I get yeah. to Blizzard? Okay, <laughs> I don't know if my advice on how to get to Blizzard um, is going to completely apply to you, but um, there's a core to this: just be kick-ass. Mm -hmm. Right? Daniel mm -hmm. Daniel says, um, you know, when when people look at your portfolio, um, there's um, they create three piles, right? Uh, can you tell them real quickly about that, Daniel? Sure, yeah. Whenever I'm interviewing for artists, I have three piles, a yes pile, a no pile, and a maybe pile. Um, now, usually you have a lot more artists applying for a position than you have positions. So uh, when you look at your portfolio, two portfolios, um, you look through the pieces and you, you look at it and say, okay, this guy's good art. But if there's a piece there in their portfolio that creates doubt as to whether they have good aesthetic, good design, if there's a bad piece, it makes you doubt that person as an artist and it moves them from the yes pile to the maybe pile. And, you know, if it's bad, if there's one good piece, a bunch of bad pieces, it goes to the no pile, you know, and if it's a bunch of good pieces and some bad pieces, you go to the maybe pile. But if it's all good pieces, it stays in the yes pile. Now, if by the time I'm done, I have my interview list that I have set up, I'm only going to pick up the yeses. And if I still have a few more that, I, you know, openings, I might go through the maybe pile. Or if I'm not quite sure, I might grab a couple of maybes. But for the most part, people knock themselves out of contention by including bad pieces in that portfolio. So you have to have that, you have to all, if all of your pieces are in the yes file, yes pile, then you can get in. I've had artists I've hired with one piece because um, it was just a real kick-ass piece. And I, I was like, show me the other stuff. Like, well, this is all work in progress, it's not ready. I'm like, 
understood. You didn't include it. You were smart enough to keep it out of your portfolio. That's fine. I see a little bit more of your process. But if you have all yes pieces, if you're delicious, man, people will fight for you. Oh, yeah, mm. for sure. You hired people with one piece in their portfolio. Did yeah. I get that correct? Holy shit. It, it depends on how badass you are. I mean, if you're, okay. if you're truly badass, it's just like, holy shit. What's, uh, what's in that piece, though? That holy shit pile. Um, well, uh, you can kind of see methodology. The more experienced you are, the more you can see, like, you can see someone's process just by looking at one painting. Mm -hmm. wow. And you can, you can ask to see other parts and pieces as long as it's not in the formal portfolio part. So if you're doing work in progress stuff or if you're labeling it as such and showing how you got to that final piece, that's totally fine. But if there are weak pieces in your portfolio that, you know, kind of demonstrate a lack of knowledge about something and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm throwing this in there because I wanted to show a watercolor piece. I don't have the watercolor, but I, th I figured it'd be good to show that I can do watercolor. Well, showing you can do it and doing it badly creates doubt in my mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the more doubt you create in art, art director's mind, the, you know, that moves you from the yes pile to the maybe pile. It's better to have fewer really kick-ass pieces. Yep. And to Carlo's uh, point, you know, um, if, you're, if you're skilled enough, when the opportunity meets your skill, that's when the luck is created. You know, you can say like, oh, it's in the right place, but you're also skilled enough at that moment to be able to capitalize on the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, like, that's how it kind of how I was discovered. You know, I, I started a place called EME Entertainment Design, which is a uh, and, and I walked in there with my portfolio. Uh, and it's it's a it's a place that makes uh, uh, sort of amusement park design stuff. And at the time, um, I worked on Universal Studios Japan doing the, the entrance to the Waterworld experience and a bunch of shops. And um, that was kind of my first gig. But really, um, I was when I was at Associates in Art, I had my portfolio with me and a sculptor that worked in the movie industry um, who was teaching at the school was walking past uh, the classroom and saw me with my portfolio and saw my portfolio. And then he came up to me and said, hey, why aren't you working in movies? Um, and, I, and I go, I don't know, you tell me. And, I, and he said, well, uh, next week I have this, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm opening my own little studio and I'm having this party, why don't you come? Right? And, yeah. you, you know, like if, if I wasn't good, he wouldn't have looked at my stuff, right? right. Yeah. And so over there, uh, I, 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 I got to meet uh, uh, Alec Gillis, who owned a shop called um, uh, Amalgamated Dynamics. And they're the guys that did every Alien movie after Aliens. And, and they did the big bugs for Starship Troopers. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, they worked on Death Becomes Her and a, and a bunch of, you know, just a bunch of different movies. Yeah. Um, uh, and they hired me. And the, my first movie gig over there was Hollow Man. Uh, you know, that Kevin Bacon, um, Invisible Man movie. And then um, I worked uh, I worked on Spider-Man over there and, and a bunch of other things, um, Tremors. Um, and like work gets work. And so that, that opened the door for me to go to, to uh, Rick Baker's um, to work on, on Planet of the Apes. Um, and then... Um, you know, that party, um, at that party, like when I was, when I was invited to go, the first thing that I did was I told Anthony that it was happening. And it's like, well, you should come with me, bring your portfolio. Right. And then he brought his portfolio and he also like advocated for himself and got, got, got some gigs. Right. And, yeah. and that, that's the other thing too. You're, 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 your the, the people that that are in, in the industry with you they're your competition but they're also your friends so you take care of them yeah right like i went to school with this guy and i was like and of course now you know you, you know him he, he, he did baby Groot and a bunch of other things and um but but also if he wasn't good you wouldn't have invited him that's right that's you right your friends abilities you yeah. wouldn't have brought him over it that's would have right. been embarrassing to you yeah if, if, for example if, if carla got to that party and he brought a friend who does bad art and said you know this is a good guy too um, it would have created doubt in people's mind that Carlo knew what good art was, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another way <laughs> to clear yourself up. Yeah. I'm not trying to say, like, don't bring your friend along. I'm saying make sure that you're confident with your friend's work, too, if you can do something as bold as bringing them along. And, you know, or, really, you gotta, yeah. or shoe on the other foot, be a worthy friend. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, be, be the kind of guy that your friends would, would, would like, recommend, right? Like, be, be that right. good. Um, so, uh, 
and that's and and you know uh, this is sort of a long long story in terms of like how I got started at Blizzard and, and it, okay so towards the end of my movie career uh, and I didn't know it was going to be towards the end of my movie career because like I, I was still being asked to go work on movies um, I was working on Van Helsing I was up here uh, at uh, in Northern California at ILM um, with uh, my my friend Warren and and, and uh, uh, a really talented uh, art director and artist Chris Alsman. Um, <laughs> finishing up on Van Helsing. And at the end of Van Helsing, one of the concept artists said, hey, we sent your, your portfolio up to the ranch. You know, how, how, how would you like to Whoa. work on, on Star art. Wars? Holy crap. Yeah. On Star Wars Episode Two. Mm-hmm. And at, at that time, you know, I was sort of getting tired of the movie biz because so many, so many artists work so hard, but they're, they're um, you know, they're, they weren't credited in movies and it was just really... Like you don't you don't see their name, but you know they're the guys that made these designs, and mm. and if you think about it, like think about all the all the people that you guys follow in terms of artists. Like you you think oh, there's so many cool artists I follow on Instagram and a bunch, but are are those the artists that are actually working in movies and creating these designs that you love? Like that's that's the thing. It, it, it's like there's there's a difference between someone that's that's you know like you know social media maven versus someone that's actually in the industry making oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the time they don't have their work out yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah so it, it just depends on and there's nothing wrong with you know what other people are doing it just depends yeah, on what your is. so but i was frustrated in the fact that you know a, a lot of a lot of us were going uncredited mm. um and and i noticed that in video games uh people got credited and and, mm. and and they respected the work of the artists because that you know those were the core people that were making these things, and so I was thinking about going into video games. So it, there was a choice. I, I would I was at the time um, uh, I, I was like contacted by one of the recruiters at Blizzard because he had seen my my work in uh, the the uh, third edition uh, Monster Manual. Ah, uh. right. For, for D and D, is that for D and D? Yeah, for D and D. Yeah, back in the day, and and, and like he was a fan of my stuff, mm. and 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 so he he wanted me to interview for the team, and so um, I, I I said to him, well, you know, there's this company called Blizzard. Uh, I didn't really know their games at the time. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a company uh, called Blizzard, and the, and they want to interview me for for a video game one, and, and I think I'm going to do that. So I chose basically working on World of War, working on Star Wars Episode Two. Ooh. So that's how I got there, you know, at, at the time. But yeah, just you know, just be good. Don't worry about it. Yeah, like imagine ah. having uh, the privilege to choose between Star Wars and World of Warcraft. You know? Yeah, uh, it's, it's such, a, it's like it's such an amazing feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's still you know, and if you're really good, it still happens today. And if if you're if you're reliable, <clears throat> people still recommend you. Like you know, yeah. I, I just I remember uh, one time when I was working on uh, Vainglory, and I was having a great time. <clears throat> you know, Filipinos were playing the game and. Um, it, it it was doing really well, and at the time it was like the number three MOBA. Um, mm. You know, this is before uh, like before Mobile Legends, I think, overtook us. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes. And, yeah. Um, and and because we didn't understand how, you know, I think the control scheme was bad. It's like it's not tuned for phone, even though the the actual gameplay was really good. Mm. Um, but you know, at the time, I, I was like creating all of these characters that, as soon as I would make them, people would cosplay it, and they were original characters. Uh, that when I was asked to go back into the movies, I was like, you know what, I, I'm having fun where I'm at. And and my friend called me and was like, hey, you want to come work on Spider Man? And it was to design. Um, so I think everybody was busy working on on Thor Ragnarok. It might have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and so they they they, they needed extra hands and they needed somebody to design uh, Vulture uh, oh, on Spider Man. So and so the they Tom were asking Holland me. One, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, and, and I was like, um, no, nah, it's, it's cool. I'm making Marvel here. Like, it's just kind of, uh, I get to make my own characters here. So like, better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven kind of <laughs> situation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I had that sort of feeling, just, you know, and it's not really going to, another feather in my cap doesn't, isn't really going to affect my career. Um, mm. and, and I'm more concerned about, you know, personal happiness and personal growth at this point. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Than credits, you know, because I think I, you know, I have enough credits. And it's <clears> fine. <throat> um, but if 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 I if I had the opportunity to really work on on a, a truly interesting project with a with a solid solid team, then 
by all means, that's that's where I would go. All right. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, are you ready is, to take in some questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, from our yeah, audience. All right. We have a question from uh, Justin Cruz. Uh, he said, mm -hmm. "Having years of experience in the art industry, what advice can you give to a starting art director or to an artist planning to become an AD?" Oh shit. Um, and and. and both me and Daniel will, will take this one. Yeah. Um, so first of all, just be a good artist. Start with that. So that you have a really good understanding of what it means to be in the trenches. So that when you're giving feedback, or you're, you're, you're like talking to another artist, you know you've been there, okay? So that, that they understand and they completely get the fact that uh, like this guy knows how to handle his shit, right? That's one thing. Yeah. The other thing is to be get get good at really truly taking care of people. <clears throat> you know, learn how to mentor people. Learn how, like even if even if it's your fellow coworkers that are sort of this. And welcome, <laughs> you, you, you gotta be like truly empathetic and and a good friend, right? And so when what and and good at your job, so that when you give someone that's your coworker some advice that they listen to you and don't think that you're just, you know, some jerk off that, that thinks that they're better than everybody else. This particularly happens, like this is very a sensitive situation in the Philippines, right? Like, you know, like, you know, you're yeah, sitting there absolutely. going like, who the fuck is he to give me fucking advice? But yeah. if it's somebody that's, that's, that you're, you're respected and, and, and like everybody knows you to be a good guy, people will listen to you. So yeah. that's where it mm -hmm. starts. And the, and the better you are at, at influencing people in a good way, the more you're going to be recognized by, by other people who are in charge that eventually start putting you into those sort of art director positions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can speak on this a little bit, Daniel. Sure. I mean, a lot of times art director is thrust upon you <laughs> before you're ready. Um, you have to realize that, um, you know, the art director's job is very different than the individual contributions you'll be making as an artist. You're going to be more of the conductor and less of the soloist, if I were to use an orchestra as a example. Mm -hmm. I would say that if you're going to be an art director, you have to have a greater understanding of the kinds of things you'll be doing. Like break down your tasks. What problems are you trying to solve? Your artists become your tools instead of your Photoshop or your painter mm -hmm. or your airbrush. Your artists become your tools. And the problems you solve are bigger. You're not looking at a myopic small thing. You're looking at the overall design of whatever it is you're doing. And you have leads or hopefully good artists you can lean on to take care of little details and come to you and bring you those things and say, hey, look, does this detail support the narrative that you're trying to say? Art director's job is to take the story or the narrative, if it's a game or if it's some kind of uh, interactive entertainment, and, and support that in every way possible and layer in as much as meaning as possible in ways that support that and get that point across visually. That's your job as an art director. And also, all the support stuff that Carlo mentioned is, is, is part, of the, part of that metric that you use to, to understand you know, whether you're going the right direction, you trust artists, you talk to them, you support them, you mentor them. They're all part of your tool set. You have to take care of your brushes, and your artists are your brushes. Sometimes you're a psychologist. You listen to an artist whine or complain, and that's OK. But you don't bring it upwards, unless it's a legitimate concern about the company. Mm -hmm. Conversely, you might be in a, in a meeting and hear a bunch of like really, you know, quick banter that producers have to use to get something across and they'll use like the most, uh, you know, inane terms to break down a good idea and they're like something that's, it's, you know, just kind of <clears throat> to. And, you know, and you don't bring that to the artist, you, you kind of interpret it and go back to the artist and say, hey guys, I think we should go more organic with some of this stuff, it's a little, little too mechanical. Like mm -hmm. if, if, to be crass, and I apologize, Carlo, if they were looking at your design and go, that's, that, that's a District 9, you know, it's too, too buggy buggy. <laughs> um, you might not. I wouldn't go up to Carlo. Hey, you buddy, buddy. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I would say, hey, Carlo, I think that they wanted a more, you know, a more um, okay. mechanical design to the guy as the cyborg, cyborg elements. Let's let's come yeah, up with yeah. similar to these shapes, okay. but mechanical. Mm -hmm. And that's that that's understanding your medium. You know, you have as an artist, you have to understand your medium, whether it's digital or whether it's uh, you know watercolor or or whether it's you know manual. And as an art director and the medium of the people that you are using because it's all hurting cats you know it's all telling i don't care how you get through the door go over the sofa go under the sofa get through the door so yeah. you're as an art director you have to understand you're gonna be pulling back from from doing individual contributions and more doing uh 
corner, kind of a, I'm gesturing emphatically now, kind of a, uh, a, a orchestration. Yeah, collaborative effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, cool. you're a force more <laughs> multiplier. It's not necessarily collaborative because everybody has to do that. Yeah. It's being a force multiplier. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. bringing out the best in people and, and, and setting up, yeah. setting up ways for them to succeed. It's not just the project succeeding, but it's just setting up ways for people to, to be better themselves and, 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 and be more valuable in general. Technically, and something you have to reconcile as well is that um, you can't do everything yourself, even though you could draw this individual thing better. You mm-hmm. might do a draw over, but you're not going to just take over that little piece because if you do, yeah. you're not looking at the entire the entire ship. You're not you're not steering right. You need to be yeah. steering the boat, steering the like the wild carriage with the horses in front of you. Tell the horses which way to go. Don't right, jump right, on yeah. that horse and try to be that horse. You know, mm. steer the wagon. What if what if um, Daniel? What if like you have an artist uh, that has a hard time getting what you want him to do. Like, uh, there's this one design that's been um, going, you know, back and forth for you know taking too long to be approved. What would you do? Because he's well, not getting it. Because he's not getting it. Yeah. Yeah. It, sometimes it's better. To, artists have their their <clears throat> their tendencies and their predictabilities and their strengths, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you know that, then you won't. You, you can sometimes you don't have the talent in the studio to do it, but you can kind of spread the load and kind of get different ideas to come together. Mm. Sometimes it's, it's also it's, it's about. I have a very very specific methodology that I use to kind of arrive at an idea that gets the stakeholders involved all throughout the process, so that by the time they get to a you know a final, they've been they know like how you got there, and you know they can they've been steering it, so you know if you're going in the right direction or not. But if if for example if you get unfortunately to that stage. Sometimes you have to reassign it to a different artist or have a different artist jump in and throw in some ideas and try to, mm, you know, I throw it okay. Also, um, like, you know, what Daniel was saying about understanding your tools, you understand your artist. If you're sitting there mm-hmm. going like, this task is not appropriate for me to give to this particular artist. It needs to go to another artist. Mm-hmm. That, that's where it starts, right? Like, do you know already whether or not the person that you are assigning the thing to will succeed? Yeah. Uh, okay. Or perhaps you you thought, okay, well, I did. I thought this guy was going to be able to do it, um, but for some reason, it's not working. Okay. First of all, you ask yourself, do I understand? If you understand the problem and you can kind of see the solution, can I mentor this person to 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 go like like this? You know, can I teach the methods and ways to be able to approach that particular problem, right? Mm-hmm. And if I can't. If I can't teach him to get there, then you know that calls that calls into question my leadership abilities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and but but I, but it might not be you. It might be that that other person. That they're just simply not capable of being able to do that. Mm-hmm. Then you have to go. Okay, well then, how do we get there? Right? Mm-hmm. Is is it is it? I just have to go in there and paint this one particular thing so that they understand. I'm like, look, I'm just going to do the face. I think the rest of the stuff is working, but I think that you've made the face look, um, you know, uh, too old, right? And and it's like this, and this is why you made it look too old. And you do the painting, and you show mm. it, to them, and you go like that, right? Yeah. And yeah. like everything else, totally worked. Yeah, don't don't sweat it. I'll take care of this part. Um, thanks for handling all the other stuff. And so you make the person feel good too because they 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 got you know you they got you eighty percent of the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, unlike Togo, <laughs> you're not going to steal the credit. Um, do you guys know that right. story? Because Togo actually was the, the the dog that carried the uh, the vaccine, not Balto. <laughs> if you guys know that story. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's like you know, honor the person for taking you know for carrying that 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 load for yeah, for yeah. for that long, and then go like, look, look, I can I can handle the rest of this stuff, right? Um, and then we and we can, so that we can put this one particular thing to bed, and we can move on to the next thing. You know, give them hope too, right? Yeah. Always think in terms of like empathy when you're doing this sort of stuff. But then some people are just assholes, and you have to cut them off. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so no, what other right. problems do you think like uh, less experienced uh, art directors do, or you guys see in mm. the industry? Uh, any... Not having a strong enough style guide, uh, mm-hmm. not having a comprehensive enough style guide that uh, effectively communicates 
the way problems should be approached in your pipeline. Because these style guides not only function internally to be able to uh, let people know um, what the look of the game is so that other artists can easily plug in. You see this a lot over at Riot and Blizzard and stuff like that. If you're doing World of Warcraft, you have to really understand what that means. Um, yeah. That's a problem that I see. The other thing is like taking uh, uh, taking people that shit on you personally. <laughs> what, it doesn't matter how good of a, a person you are. If you're in leadership, there's always somebody that's going to be unhappy and talk shit behind your back. Oh. Just handle it. Just yeah. don't fucking worry about it. It doesn't matter. Someone's opinion of you is no business of yours. It is as long as you're, if you're honestly doing your job effectively, you know, as a good human being, um, and you have to be honest with yourself, right? And not be defensive, then don't worry about that stuff. Yeah. You, you can't always be everybody's best friend. You know, you try to create a, a, an atmosphere of understanding and, and, and mm -hmm. You know, nurturing, and that's—I think that's important too. I think some some first-time art directors get stuck in with like trying to have to please the boss and mm -hmm. the cop of the of the team. Take care of your brushes, you know, and you have to understand that. But also know when it's a brush isn't working and move to a different yeah. brush. You know, be able to handle that. The decision needs to be made. Sometimes there's a lot of hard calls that art directors have to make, and they will respect you more for being able to make those hard calls with precision and strength, and um, you know, to do it quickly. Than to try and you know, pussyfoot around with it and end up making everybody unhappy. Yeah. You know, designed by committee is not good. <laughs> you have to be able to, um, and and to Carlos' point, uh, a style guide is something huge you need to establish because it'll do a, a lot of the work for you when you're trying to establish look and shape and design and form and what the themes are. So, like one thing you will do in, in pre-production is use that time wisely so you end up with a style guide. You know, use yeah. that to build your style guide. So that when you're onboarding artists, you know, one, it's one thing to make a really nice vertical slice, but as soon as you start like onboarding artists to build them <coughs> up, you'll be able to get them on board quickly with your vision. Yeah. If they start doing their own shit, um, you know, and, and going, oh, you know, I think, I think Raziel should have a, you know, a beard, and you're like, he doesn't have a lower jaw, and it's like, well, put a lower jaw on him. Like, no, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know, that's, um, that's that's something you need to be able to nip right in the bud because you know, an artist will go off on a tangent and make something that doesn't work. And you need yeah. to correct them. So a style guide yeah. gives you time. Daniel, um, yep. we have uh, one question from Cedric Kunanen. Mm -hmm. No, hey, Cedric. <laughs> yeah, he says hey, hi. Says hi. <laughs> Daniel and to Carlo. Um, he hey. said, um, uh, Daniel mentioned good design is ethic. And can you ask him to elaborate on what makes a good design aesthetic and what goes into that? <laughs> wow. Okay, that's a question. Carlo and I can both, uh, uh, both yeah. answer this one. <laughs> you get started. Uh, well, no, okay. You can start showing uh, your sketches as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the uh, part of part of what makes a good design is an aesthetic that's built up over time, right? You like Carl and I were talking about references earlier. You're going to be building up a lot of um, a lot of forms and shapes that that come up from your your own uh, your own sensibilities, right? So you have to trust yourself and like yourself as an artist. And that's not that's not always easy. Sometimes, you know, you, you have to go through a lot as an artist, but the, the most important thing is to be able to develop shape language and form language based on uh, your aesthetic and you have to build that aesthetic. I mean, you know, it's hard to say I know I'm good or I know what I'm good, but you can look at it and basically absorb a lot of different artists and keep pushing those boundaries, keep trying different things and taking chances and, you know, build your fundamentals, build your ability to render, your ability to form, and then build your design fundamental. Look at shape language, look at artists you like, page through artists you like before you start sketching. It'll get you inspired. Um, you know, for Raziel, we did a lot of crazy stuff. We had stuff where we were just gonna be an undead, you know, looking a lot more undead where he had like, you know, pieces sticking out of him that he strapped onto his body. I, ultimately, this, this aesthetic changed, of course. We simplified, we streamlined, we added a little more mad, madman, we added, you know, different ideas. But yeah. the aesthetic is there. You're already designing for, for different aspects of it, you know. At one point, we had Raziel's wings that were going to be set up to his arms, and, you know, we had the idea that it would, like, fold outwards, fold inwards, and rip them from his arms. And that was cool, but the PlayStation couldn't do that. So we're like, oh, okay, yeah, that would be tough. 
Mm. Uh, the wings are going to come out from a different way, but we couldn't show that with, so there was a restriction and always be restrictions, no matter how good the technology is. So we, you know, we ripped yeah. it and it was back instead. So a, a good aesthetic comes from uh, absorbing a lot of good art and, and basically in, at the beginning of your art career, regurgitating that stuff, you don't have to show it to anybody, but you can just regurgitate it, you know, and, and start showing off like different aspects of, of what makes it fun. Like your, your rendering has to be solid, but your shape language is also something that kind of falls into play and, and grows as you go as an artist. So I, it's, it's hard to be objective about your own aesthetic. And Carlo, you know the difficulty of this. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> if you build a, a, a good language from um, you know your experiences, you can you can start building confidence in yourself and being able to present these ideas. And you'll see people respond to certain ideas better, more or less, right? Like my aesthetic is different than than our the artists. You know, I, I I have like you know it's very like you know tooth forward kind of design. I like to push the the muzzle forward a lot on a lot of my creature designs, and that's my, that's my aesthetic. You know, I understand it's it's you know. And if some days I'll be like, ah, oh, I want to go completely reverse and change that around, and that's fine. You can, you can totally do that kind of stuff. You can push inwards instead of outwards and try different things. But you know, um, there are fundamentals still inside of this. You know, even the yeah. way you pose a hand is just from you know, Loomis. So you know, right, they, right. Um, one of the things yeah. that I try to do is not to be a slave to my aesthetic because there's going to be problems that can't be solved by like what my uh, default reactions are to a particular situation. So um, I, I, tr- I try to always stretch. I try to always do like something different. I try to always like, like for example, if someone came up to me and asked me to design furries, I mean, I can't, <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not yeah. going to back away from it. I'm not going to go like, okay, fur, what, furries are gross. Fuck it. Um, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to see if I can honor it, you know, and, and kind of understand you know, what's going on beneath there. Because these mm-hmm. these sort of like animal human archetypes have existed forever, whether we're talking about um, you know in in the Philippines stick balang or we're we're talking about yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, ancient Egyptian gods, I have to honor that situation and and, mm-hmm. and understand what what are the uh, um, what are the logical underpinnings of what's happening, uh, so that I can really understand the culture and not not be uh, cynical about it. Part of, part of um, what you were talking about furries even is like, you know, that's just a, an extreme. If you're looking at it like a slider, mm-hmm. that's just an extreme, like we slide over to one side. Um, you could argue that some of the designs you do for video games are furries, you know, and just, just tone down certain things or turn up, tone up certain things. Like in Soul Weaver, we had a lot of bondage stuff that was actually incorporated mm-hmm. into the designs of the characters, right? You know, and, yeah. it, you know, on, on a certain level, that could be kind of furryish. So it's like, you know, you have to think about like where you're going with it, but also be brave and put it out there and see how, how it resonates, you know? And yeah. like Carlo, if you were to do a furry, I'm sure your your design aesthetic would take it in a different direction and make it, you sure. know, uh, different, you know? And it's just a kind of um, understanding of who you are as an artist. And again, I think we talked about this before, like there's a lot of times your parents might, you know, smush your your, your validity and without thinking about it, without knowing it, they might actually smush it. So you have to be able to nurture that back up again, especially if you're in art school or something like that, build confidence and be able to put your drawings out there and, and really absorb and try different things, uh, push your aesthetic, push what you think is good and see how that resonates. Okay, um, uh, Decap, I have one question, but I was like holding on since a while ago. If if ever, um, given the chance that you guys do a remake, if ever, for uh, Legacy of Kane, do you think you would redo some of the designs, like make it better because we have better technology right now? Do you think you would do a, like, you will add something to the... Or pre- yeah, or you would you like still stick to the core yeah. Uh, yeah, aesthetics the and or design of, let's say, maybe Raziel or... Yeah. Kane, yes. or... First of all, he needs to fucking call me. <laughs> okay. Okay, and right. now right. you can answer the question. <laughs> Go I want to get a stick to the face if I don't call him. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll show you one thing real quickly. This is a kind of a, a fun secret for Razio. Back when we built him, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen right now. Um, yep. Oh yeah. We had uh, we had designed him. And I'll show you this right next to his uncrushed form. His shoulder pad was actually supposed to be part of his design for the final. It was supposed to 
fall next to him and he's supposed to piece himself back together almost Rambo style, you know, where he's like putting a piece here, putting a piece there. In fact, we just end up, you know, simplifying that a lot in the intro. But that little shoulder piece, if you can see this right here, was supposed uh, to be. I don't think we can, we can, you're sharing the. Oh. Answer. You can't see my screen? No, no. We can't see the photo you're trying to. Yeah, uh, we're seeing the wrong screen. We're seeing um, one of the. We're seeing a, a no, goblin sorry. looking monster. Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me see. Oh, I see what it's doing. I see. Yeah, yeah. Doing. This one's interesting. Yeah. Cool. You have to pick the. Yeah window yeah. yeah i think you're only sharing uh okay so one this is raziel one. right before he died um before he got transformed and if you look at his shoulder pad here this piece um that was actually going to be on raziel when he when he was destroyed the pieces are going to fall next to his body he's going to find them and scrap himself together and so this piece was supposed to unfold and actually go across oh, sorry that's wrong uh, okay. we still can't see it. The, the dance. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It, sorry. Not, it hasn't. Oh, um, we can't see it. Oh, there oh, you. No, there no. we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Perfect. 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 There we go. Sorry, guys. Uh, so yeah, so this shoulder piece here was supposed to be spread out. Like it's it's actually supposed to be split around across his back. Mm. Um, has it loaded for a while? Yeah, it is. It has, it has. Oh yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. There's a delay, sorry. Okay, carry on. <laughs> sorry, Decab. Sorry for cutting you no, off. No worries, no worries, no worries at all. Um, <clears> so yeah, that, that's kind of what um, I was talking about, and I'm, I'm going to bring it up in a second here. <clears> I, have, I have Raziel's other, um, the other image of Raziel, and I will put that in Discord in just a second. Actually, I'll, I'll, throw it in the okay, I'll throw this up there. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> Can you see this? Yes, we do. Blue Raphael. So it's supposed to be spread across his back. And that was supposed to be one of the things we were going to do. And we, it's kind of in the uh, the PlayStation 1 version of him, where it's actually drawn on there, and you can see a little pattern on his back. Yeah. We created, so our idea, our basic idea for Raziel was simple forms, complex details. So mm. um, we would carry that. I would carry that forward. I would basically look at um Razio and basically find more details that we couldn't put in the PlayStation verse and add those to him while keeping the general silhouette and aesthetic the same because I like his aesthetic I like the shape that he has you know that yeah. was, there was never a greater time where you could just take your aesthetic throw it in something and actually have it be the defining principle and so <clears throat> all the stuff in Soul Reaver is you know a lot of that stuff is our our general aesthetic and principles from a personal point of view being put out there and you know being part of what it is but also you know we, we would up the polygons <clears throat> excuse me make the monsters more detailed i think kane would have to be um altered his face just because um i know so much about 3d faces now that his, his he has an expression on his face mm. and so um we would you have to take that expression off and neutralize it and stuff like that so i'd be doing those kind of things but also be trying to hang on to like what, what worked so it's kind of uh it's kind of a six and one half dozen. You, you take some of the aesthetic that worked and some of the aesthetic that didn't work and, um, and update it. Update it, yeah, exactly. Give it a chance and uh, move on to something that has a, a, a more, you know, a more feasible aesthetic for PlayStation or for, you know, next generation. <laughs> I mean, I, like I said, it, it'd be a jumble of, of fun things. Um, and that would be part of why we would Part of what we would do is like just jump to a different, um, a different design aesthetic. You know, be mm, able yeah, to yeah. Kane's design and actually, I actually would have morphing technology. I would have Kane as a, a beautiful young man and have him go into this elder mode. For yeah. example, when in sunlight because it's armor. Yeah. So basically, yeah. you would look like a normal person, um, almost, uh, you know, almost like a Elric, and have him mm. walk into sunlight, have him morph dynamically. I'd use technology just for that kind of stuff. I would have the, I would have um, all kinds of stuff happen in sunlight that didn't happen in the shadows. The magic would be different. You know, you could neutralize the vampire magic in sunlight, and that's a really complex design. Like you could do a lot of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I would have, uh, I would have the spectral mode in a localized shape around mm -hmm. Kane Razio, <clears throat> instead of like going all the way outwards to the entire world. So you can basically locally um, morph the world. And uh, we try those kind of things, you know, just push yeah. the technology to new boundaries. So 
PlayStation 5 streaming technology. Yeah, PS5 is coming yeah. out with a, a lot of cool yeah. um, Unreal. technological Unreal. advances yeah. and all that. No more polygon limits. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. No more lighting limitations, man. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And polys, yeah. I mean, like, for example, if I was if I was working uh, with Daniel on it, I was like, since we have a shorthand uh, and and we have like uh, a relationship with each other, it's it's uh, it's an opportunity to go, hey, hey, Daniel, uh, one, uh, you guys are going to be able to do all co- kinds of cool shit. Why don't you put me in the basement <laughs> and do the fucked up yeah, shit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me do some fucked up shit for this, right? Like, I I, I would I would design a scene where, you, for for example, if you were going to see Kane for the you know. You're going to do a reveal of Kane, um, where Kane's completely debauched, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and kind of like he's sitting there, and he has these like these tubes connected to syringes, connected to a person, and he's dr- he's drinking blood like like someone smoking a hookah pipe. Yeah, like, yeah, I, mean, I, would yeah. Even, I would even dress that person. The person oh who God. Were, like stuck into the. <laughs> Like the carotid um, mm-hmm. is where it's going to come from, but I would also dress that person beautifully as if it was an ornate thing that's sitting there. And yeah, that's like they're a, there. Um, they're there like of their own thing. free will, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's just like it, it doesn't matter. All I, I want to establish, yeah. like for example, whatever town or principality he lives in, that the people completely trust him as a leader. Yeah, almost like yeah. the idea of Dracula being kind of like this hero prince he might be fucked up but he destroys the turks like mm, that's yeah. you know, just to establish character moments like that and going like I, i'm not going to be worrying about the design so much because you know the aesthetic is kind of established and, and i will you know whatever he needs me to do i'll do that mm-hmm. but what i'm going to think what i'm going to be thinking about is like how do i uh further kind of um uh, uh advocate for the things that have been previously established in new mm. fucked up ways. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, that, I think that'd be awesome. I think what would, following that aesthetic of even Dracula is like hanging them from the walls beautifully with these long kind of um, cloth, like, you know, <laughs> hanging or hanging mm. them from rafters, rafters and having like a complex series of like webbing that looks like tubes and stuff like that. Just mm. as like, you know, as you walk into an area and see just that, it's like, wow, that's, that's really powerful imagery. And that's something we could do. And that's, um, you know, because if you think about Cain, he's been alive for centuries and his plans failed. You know, the things he wanted to do and he knows they're going to fail. That's the thing is like he's looked into this this time machine and, and seen like all these different situations that just don't work. And he, in some ways, he, he hasn't necessarily given up, but he's just like, fuck it, you know, and sits there and stoic, <laughs> botch things. What would you do if you, you knew that, you know, your empire would crumble no matter how much you built it up, that your lieutenants that you built would eventually turn to monsters? Uh, and people you trusted and love. How much do you love them and trust them? If you know how much you invest, if you know it's gonna go, I'll go, I'll go south at some point. You're not sure when, but it will. You know, you would try to invest in them now too. So there's, yeah. and after a few centuries, you get bored with regular stuff. You, your aesthetic would change. Yeah, that, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's that's something I think that um, you know, we have to talk about. I mean, uh, something I was talking about again with Rosie. I only get to this before, but uh, his wings were a. Uh, I usually attached to his arm, so we had some wing, wing designs where we had um, early Raz and stuff like that. We had the wings opening up from his arms, you know. We have ripping it from his from his arms down, and the PlayStation couldn't do that. Uh, originally, yeah. we had like, kind of folded up sections, and so eventually yeah. we had to. I love those wings. It. Yeah, I think the scene went from um, him like uh, I think Kane kind of bending his back wing or something. Yeah. 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 Ripping it off, yeah. Yeah, yeah ripping so, it off, yeah. And so, so yeah, yeah and so we had to find ways that worked with those things. So I think I would kind of explore some of those uh, different aesthetics. And, and definitely, Carlo and I would, would have a shorthand. We would throw it around, and then we would do a, a painting, for, you know, and, and present that to the to the sh- other sh- stockholders and show them some of the imagery to kind of capture their imagination and mm-hmm. sell the idea. Because one thing people don't realize is that concept artists also sell ideas, you know, to uh, for for prop for proposals. Mm-hmm. You know, game proposals, movie proposals, you know, and you're the first line of defense when it comes to creating that stuff. That's right. I mean, look at the, um, look at uh, Ralph McQuarrie. Like, that's how they got, you know, Star Wars to be made, like his paintings that they showed around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. Very true. 
Yeah, so follow-up <laughs> question, where, wh when's, uh, when's the next Soul Reaver coming out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not up to me. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. I'm, I'm excited to say that I'm going to be um, doing more uh, Soul Reaver artwork. Just I'm, I'm starting a Patreon, and I will be mm -hmm. um, having artists and uh, different people collaborating, and I'll be uh, able, able to vote on some, some merchandise that I'm going to make. I'm planning some merchandise to create. Mm -hmm. and, uh, some drawings that'll be available. I'll be making sketches that people haven't seen before. I'll be making those available uh, through the Patreon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, I think that'll be something that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and mm -hmm. a lot of fun to interact with people and kind of imagine the next Soul Reboot that would look like. Yeah. And some of those things together. You know? Yeah. Let us know and we'll, you know, we'll link it down in the description or mm -hmm. somewhere down here. Artist feature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that'd be awesome. Uh, we also have another question from uh, G, I think. I hope I said that right. G de la Cruz. Yeah. Um, of all the art fundamentals you went through all these years, which is, which one is the mo the one you struggled with? How long did you procrastinate before tackling it, and how did you overcome it? It's, wow, uh, Carlo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's so profound. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, it's. First of all, um, one of the things you realize is that, um, you know, you, you can't, uh, sometimes you got to get away from it and just kind of sit there and be like, oh, this isn't working. This is like, this is, I'm going to come back to it, you know, and sometimes that gets really, uh, a really long time, a little longer than it takes. Mm, uh, yeah. For us, I think it was, at least for me, um, I think there were designs for, uh, for, I, th I think it, it, was, it must have been some of the designs for, for Buffy that took the longest um, because that, that project was a lot of pain. Uh, there was a lot of stuff involved, a lot of political stuff involved that I won't get into, but it took a while to get to where we wanted to with that, um, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, I had to get away from it for a while, go down the beach, um, you know, have a drink, look at, look at the ocean for a while and kind of close my eyes and imagine the world that I wanted to create and what kind of stuff would happen to it. And almost when you're a kid, you play, you imagine stuff and you have to be able to take your own aesthetic and create your own world in your head and play and be able to imagine scenarios and see what that looks like. And then good creative stuff will happen. You mm -hmm. have to get stuff in your head. And that's, that's what happened. You get stuck. You're like, Oh, you know, this is a licensed property. You can do so much with it. What can we do within those confines to create something cool? And you have to kind of get away from it for a while and stop listening to all the what you can't do mm -hmm. and start looking at what you can do, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it's sort of it's sort of a weird question. Um, yeah. Like fundamentals, right? Like yeah. what, 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 what would you be running away from? I've, I've run away from sub subject matter because I didn't have the tools to do them at the time. Um, but it, it's, it's also something that's made me angry at myself for, for, for not doing in terms of fundamentals, um, like to me, it, it's just it's it's just another tool set. I mean, like, there's no reason to be afraid of a fundamental. Yeah. I think it's. I, let me unpack this a little bit, okay? And and this is for the the person asking the question. Actually, I think you're anxious. I think what what you're trying to do is prove to everybody that you can do a beautiful painting right away when you start a piece. It's like you're so anxious about making that piece beautiful that you that you skip and try to do shortcuts to get to what you quote unquote think is beautiful instead of doing something that can stand on its own and it is like internally consistent. Well right? <laughs> and, and, and that probably has something to do with your anxieties. You have to let that go, right? Um, because the objective, each piece of artwork is just a snake skin being shed. It's not the snake, True. right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're the snake, right? You're not the skin, and the skin is just basically a a a, a symbol of of what you were at the time that you shed it. Okay, so yeah. you know you're not going to get any kind of longevity in this career, and people are not going to trust you if you keep like dwelling on those particular anxieties. Now, um, let me turn it to the thing that 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 I was weak at, right? Now I was anxious about doing mechanical stuff because mm -hmm. um, you know my background was doing 
kind of uh, organic illustrations and 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 like drawing the monsters human figures, and humanoids. Monsters. Yeah. yeah. So uh, early on in my career, I got interviewed for a job to work on a on a movie, <laughs> uh, and it was Bicentennial Man, um, and I didn't get the job because they went through my my uh, portfolio and said, well, I, I don't have I don't see any I don't see any like Mechanical robots stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and so we're not going to hire you. And at the time, I was still doing part-time jobs, and I had to quit my part-time not art job in order to just take the uh, the interview. And and now I had no job, right? Mm -hmm. And I was so mad at myself. And then I said to myself, "Look, I'm going to get good at mechanical stuff. Not only that, in the future, people will know me for my mix." Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. So it, it and and that taught that taught me to to keep going at stuff that I feel that I'm weak at um, in order to like just become a stronger and, and, and better concept artist and, and, and art director. Um, and, and I've learned too that um, the, the times when I'm the most stressed is usually uh, right before I, I go through some really profound evolution. And so I've learned to trust that process over the years. Carlo is what I would call a Saiyan at art. Yeah. <laughs> makes, yeah, makes him stronger, and he comes back more well, angry at himself, and then better. He gets, and he trains inside of a small little like time chamber <laughs> to back even better. Like a hermit. That that's true. I mean, you okay. look. You, you gotta forgive yourself if you run from something. You gotta forgive yourself, and then basically, but like to Carlos, I think Carlos' methodology is probably the best way to possibly look at it. Is just mm -hmm. say, you know, I, I I failed at this, but you know what? Next time I'm not going to. I'm gonna make myself so good. <laughs> so delicious and so known for this that you know no one will ever ever be able to question me about this ever again yeah, that's a great attitude to have as an artist yeah absolutely um, agree. Mm -hmm. yeah and be honest with yourself too like if, if it's not working for the for that moment it's just that moment yeah yeah it's just a moment the career so, is long yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely I feel the pain <laughs> But that's okay. Pain is good. <laughs> the endless pain, you know, the torture of, you know, forever evolving, trying to yeah, evolve, yeah, trying true. to be better, you know. Yep. So at that's... this point, I think uh, we should announce that there would be another demo at 2 p.m. Uh, GMT plus 8. Yeah, Later. that's Philippine time. Yeah, 2 p.m. GMT plus 8. That will be 11 p.m. LA time. Yeah, this is for Decap's demo since we got a little bit carried away <laughs> on Carlo and you know wow. the conversation and all yeah. that. Yeah. I, I so, guess it take a, a really long time. So yeah. uh, we have so, another. Yeah, yeah, by now we're just taking more questions and we have another question. Uh, I have I another know. question for Daniel though. Um, like, hmm. uh, how different is any of the, of this, like the game industry? It, uh, how different it is in 10 to 20 years. I mean, sorry, sorry, let me rephrase. How different was the game industry or ent entertainment industry 10 to 20 years ago? And how different uh, are big companies like Sony or, you know, compared 10 to 20 years ago? And, you know, smaller studios as well. Well, I mean, companies have gotten a lot more knowledgeable now about art processes and uh, technologies and stuff like that. Ten years ago, you kind of shoot from the hip, you know, because the technology was so simple, um, especially on PlayStation and stuff like that. You know, you couldn't get like 700 polygons for a character. You had four megabytes of RAM. So you had to basically interpret your art in a way that allowed it to jump on screen. So it forced you to do like big shapes and things like that. It also mm -hmm. forced you to shy away from certain kinds of details or being too big with your or grandiose with some of your ideas. Mm -hmm. It also... The, because of the lack of knowledge about certain aesthetic processes and ideas, there was less process involved. It was easier to get an idea on screen from you, but if you were a bad artist, then it was a bad idea. So you see a lot of bad art 10 to 20 years ago as well, a lot of mediocre stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of great stuff, you know, it just depends. I think I, we got really lucky with Soul Reaver that we had great artists on that team that were able to interpret what we were trying to do and be able to get that on screen. Um, it was also a crapshoot. If, if we had bad artists on there, it would have, failed completely so it's more reliant on that whereas i think nowadays because so many more people are in the concept design so many more people are in the 3d that are good sculptors that it's easier to make um good looking art mm -hmm. it's a little harder to make a great looking game because 
you know, the more it's more complex to make a game, you know, the more it's getting movie budgets, you know, and you're getting and it's not necessarily all going into the art. It's going to, like, you know, getting the technology up and running and getting all of those things working. Yeah. So you, you, you earn from one, you take from another. You know, it's 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 become more movie like and, you know, the movie industry is brutal. So it can get a little more brutal as we go. Yeah, but, but the yeah. movie industry is becoming more game like. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mandalorian. All of the environments in the Mandalorian, that's all unreal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's crossing oh, yeah. over a lot more. So yeah, that's that's kind of neat too. It's like a, there, there's but you know what you know what is consistent between those is a good aesthetic, good design, mm -hmm. good fundamentals, all that stuff still applies. There's no AI that's magically gonna make your stuff better. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The push make good button is not there. There's no such right. thing. And should should we get to the the point where where we have a lot more AI tools, and of, of course we we have a lot more tool support, so we can create more amazing images. That yes. doesn't mean that if you're a mediocre artist that you'll still succeed, because us badass motherfuckers in the industry will have the same tools. <laughs> That's right? true. Thank you. So, <laughs> like, you know, some 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 like some kid with an AK-47 is is a kid with an AK-47, but a Navy SEAL armed with an AK-47 is a Navy SEAL armed with an AK-47. <laughs> yeah. You get what, you get what I'm saying? So yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. It, it's not Wait, like you but... can escape being good. Yeah. yeah. The tool does not make you uh, good. It's how you use it. Right. So. Yeah, right. Well, so thank you very much. I hope many of the young artists would hear that and quit. <laughs> you know, just don't <laughs> two words. Look, look man. When I when I teach when mm -hmm. I teach I, I you know you always have that professor that goes like hey uh, take a look around you look at all the people in this class and then they say you know uh, only ten percent of you are going to be here. That's not the speech I give. Like, I know that's going to happen. What mm -hmm. you want to do is you wake them up. You're like, look at everybody in this class. They're not your competition. I am. Mm, true, true, yeah. Right? Mm, yeah, that's good. I mean, I, and what I'm really saying is that you need to be badass, <laughs> badass enough that you can sit next to me and be my wingman if we need to go, you know, go to town yeah. on, a, on a design. Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be times when you and I are going to be working 14 hours a day on something that needs to be solved. And if I can't trust you, Mm -hmm. I want somebody else next to me. Right. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a brotherhood. It's 300, man. You have to be able to hold your shield next to the guy next to you and understand that the guy next to you is going to cover you as well. You know? Yeah, because yeah. it's like it's a hard... Sometimes... I, I, look, I don't want to complain about it because, look, I'm not, I'm not a coal miner in Chile. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but in terms of hours, it can be really difficult. And if you're really if you're working at a AAA studio with like a like a high octane uh, uh, IP that you're working on, you're going to spend more time with those people in that studio than you will be with your own families. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And the law, and if you keep fucking up, right, and you yeah. cause people to stay late and away from their families, you're taking life away from them. So you need to be good enough so that you can support your team. Yeah. I don't think there's also, I don't think people realize there's, a, there's an anxiety to actually getting a good IP as well. Yeah. And then imposter syndrome takes over and all kinds of stuff. You got to be good enough. So responsible. Yeah. You got to be responsible and good enough at your work that you can handle it, you know, and, and be able to help and contribute. Keep that thing moving. Don't weigh it down. And uh, that, that anxiety will happen. Everybody goes through it. There's nothing unique. You're not, your anxiety is yeah. nothing new, you know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. All of us go through it. Yeah, absolutely. It's how you handle it that's important. You know, be a saint. Yeah. Be a saint, you know, like Carlo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it comes down from, like, mm, having a little bit of a competitive attitude about it because you know there's only a few spots. I mean, real talk, like, if uh, I was saying this yesterday to the, uh, to the moderators, um, when when you when you think about getting into hey I want to work on the Marvel movies okay how many people are actually concept artists working on the Marvel movies at any given time maybe twenty maybe yeah right your chances of getting on that team are more astronomical than you getting into the NBA yeah that's real yeah. okay I totally agree <laughs> I feel so sorry. so you have to approach it in in that way. But, uh, yeah. you know, to give you guys hope, the, this industry is much bigger now than when me and Daniel started. So there's a lot more opportunities out there for you. Yeah. But again, the world is opened up. 
So there's a lot more competition. Yeah, as much as me advocate that your peers are not your competition, but in reality of how the industry works, it's always, you know... uh, They're your competition, but they're they're also your friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you know what I mean? Like, Anthony's my competition, but at the same time, he's my friend. Yeah. Uh, And, and like, if if there's something that's happening, there's always a shortage of really good people. Because honestly... It doesn't matter if even if the world opens up, um, uh, talent and resilience is are rare commodities. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, well, that, and they'll help you too. They'll help you get jobs. It's not like they're going to stop you from getting a job because they want that job. It's like once they get yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Like they'll, they'll call you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've ever stopped. Like actively trying to stop someone. stop someone, yeah. But you know what? Yeah. The, the 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 like me and Daniel or your competition is real shit, because like I remember you guys know Anthony Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so AJ posted this story about like oh he was trying to go for a job one time, mm-hmm. and he you know he sent his portfolio and he did all of these other things, and then they said um we decided to go with somebody else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so he went and researched and, and to try to find out. Well, I wonder who who they hired for that position. And then he found out it was me. <laughs> and he went, "Oh my God, my art senpai, like the dude that I that that I learned <laughs> from, is is the dude that got the job." Senpai. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, like to, to me, like that's the that's the reality of it. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And there's going to be times too when 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 like um, you're going to be asked to support your heroes. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. When I was when I was working uh, in in the movie industry, one time uh, there was a there was a job. It was the uh, I think it was called the Sixth Day. Was it the Sixth Day? You know the the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie with the clones. Oh, I'm not familiar yet. I think so, but I don't remember. The yeah, it was some yeah. years ago. But I remember like being called to go in there, and and what I was being asked to do was to support Ron Cobb and uh, mm. asked to design the clones while Ron designed all of the mechanical stuff around. Mm. Right, because 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 Ron's specialty isn't isn't that right, and and, and uh, you know. Um, and I, and I was like, holy shit, this is this is weird. Or 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 <laughs> showing up at a studio and having hey. Alex, <laughs> Alex Nino's there, and then you're supporting him because you're doing like some of the sci-fi like guns and stuff while while Alex is doing the the characters. So you know you you, you gotta be ready. Yeah, you gotta be ready. That's okay. That's 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 part of the understanding that you learn that one way or another. You'll learn it. <laughs> Better to be prepared. That, you know then yeah. surprised yeah okay. yeah it's not like you're gatekeeping anyone or anything it's just no, part no. of it yeah right 100%. unless you're an yeah. asshole yeah unless yeah. you are unless you let's, are. let's be real if you're a jerk though like it's like mm, probably yeah we can see the industry is constantly growing but it's also a small industry word gets around <laughs> yeah word gets pretty around. much if you're pretty a jerk much. if you're a jerk like people know they'll recommend somebody else yeah yeah but if to that thing where that that um, point if Carl got a job and he needed help and he needed someone who follows along his line of aesthetic to pick a student that he worked with you know that he liked those people will get, will get a call you know because they're mm. good in class and they, they can follow it direction when they improved and they super saved it and you know yeah and so even if you weren't great at the time if you got better and your portfolio was cool then Carl might and Carl like working with you he'll call you yeah mm. or, or right on the spot like um, uh, Daniel knows this story. It's you know when I was when I was at uh, Comic Con one year, and this is for the students out there. When I was at Comic Con one year, um, I met Richard Taylor over at Weta Workshop, and he was like asking me if I could come to to New Zealand to you know ostensibly to work on the Hobbit. Oh. So, but at the time it was just kind of like you know I'm you know, I think I was working over. Maybe it, it might have been at Insomniac, but at the time I was like, I, I was happy, you know, I, and and I didn't just like today. I don't need an I don't need more credit on my on my thing. And I said, you know what? Uh, I'm I'm actually really busy right now, but I have a student. His name is Ben Morrow, um, yeah. mm-hmm. and and let me introduce you to him. So I went over to Scott Robertson's booth and, and grabbed Ben, and it's like, Ben, you got your mm-hmm. portfolio. And took him over there, and it's like, here, here's Ben. Take a look at his stuff. And that's how he got started in movies. And I'm sure you know who he is. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. He he he's one of the 
artist who did like um smog i guess uh like, he did a lot of the the elven armor um, yeah. He did a lot. He did a lot of the. If you see, if you've seen the movie Valerian, he did. He did a lot of those. Oh, I see. And yeah. costume yeah. designs. Um, you know, uh, he worked on um, uh, uh, Elysium and Planet uh, of the Apes. I guess the newer. Yeah, one? well, I mean, like, just look him up, dude. He's worked on a lot of <laughs> shit. Uh, can you tell me the name again? I'm sorry, I'm so bad. Ben with Morrow. Ben, ben Morrow. Uh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I'm sure you know his stuff. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> he almost like um became my teacher in M F Z D, but uh, oh yeah, okay, he left, yeah. The right, same right, right. Time, yeah. So yeah, um, I have five more questions for you guys. Yeah, and... probably the last five questions, yeah, and then yeah, because we're so kind of pushing five. it and probably taking too much of your time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, one of them is like um. As a creative director, what's the ideal trait that a junior artist should possess inside the studio? If we're talking about like whether or not you're already uh, you're already good, right? If you already have the skills, okay. Um, flexibility and oh. resilience, like t t toughness and flexibility. No, those are the those are the two things. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that's that that's because it's really important because um we're all depending on you mm -hmm. yeah right i mean like let's make sure first of all that you're good you know that you can do beautiful appealing pieces okay like that that should be the given but once you're in there um being a supportive team member that um that helps everybody out and make sure that um you know, you deliver the things that you were uh, committed to delivering uh, at the end of the week is, is super important. I, I, maybe you can talk to this, uh, Daniel, a little bit. No, I definitely agree with everything you said, Carlo. The important thing for a, a junior artist to have, especially if they want to move up, is to be able to take extra responsibilities by, first of all, handling your business and then being able to be willing to help out on whatever needs to be helped out with, you know. Listen, keep your ears open. Talk to artists. If you hear discussions going on with people asking, oh, you know what, this one creature design isn't going so great, take a crack at it and show it to the art director and say, look, I know you don't, it's no skin off your teeth, but just take a look at this, you know? Um, that's how I got, um, you know, up and uh, I got raised to an art director at Crystal Dynamics. Is like, you know, I was looking at the creature designs. I was like, I don't like these designs. Let me try mine. And then, uh, you know, it, it just went, went higher and higher. So be flexible, be willing to contribute. Be willing to get feedback without being emotional, you know, and like throwing yourself uh -huh. off the cliff. You should be able to take the feedback and, and become stronger because of it and contribute to those ideas. Mm. Yeah. That's fun, you know? The ability to contribute in really unique ways that, that are above and beyond the things that have been asked about asked from you mm. is so valuable. Like like I um when I was working on uh, resistance at Insomniac, when I was there, I, I was my first week. I was tasked to help design or help improve the designs of the aliens that were that were in there. And so I'm doing that. But like at lunch, I saw that the guns weren't given a enough love, so I designed a bunch of guns too, and it wasn't assigned to me, right? Okay. But by by that Friday meeting, it was all like, oh, well, Carlo has these guns to to uh, to present, and so yeah. those guns became like. The, the the creative director was like holy shit we'll make them do the jeeps like right the jeeps you know <laughs> yeah and then so you, you're just kind of um you know <clears throat> being valuable in terms of you you get excited about the project that you're working on yeah right mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that it succeeds like this this love of the project is so important for a junior artist. absolutely yeah good okay. concept art will will get the people who make it excited to make it and fight over it yeah. Yeah. You're the, the team's fighter. cheerleader, man. Yeah, you can be the one who really brings it home, brings it home and creates that aesthetic. So, you know, don't think about your role. Think about how you can contribute. Yeah. That's right. Take that, that's that's one of the that's a really good point, Daniel. Like be more concerned about being a contributor rather than an influencer. How about that? Yeah. Ooh. How about that? Uh, I do have like uh, one question based on that. Um do you think um, a team of mediocre artists who works really well together with really good chemistry that uh, brings out really good um, uh, execution and, you know, stuff, 
works better than a group of really good like badass artists who doesn't really work together and just give you headaches which one would you prefer like a more experienced and more talented and not not talented but you know more yeah, uh... like a bunch of badass artists but they like really bad chemistry or a bunch of like like um they could execute mediocre or, or you know you good. can talk a little bit about this daniel i actually have like <clears throat> experience in in some of these situations but good no, no, I, but really I good yeah 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 you, you, I mean, you, tell, you, tell yeah, you gotta think about it like a basketball team right it's like yeah. you can have like one guy that's like rock star and everyone just throws the ball to him but that guy's gonna carry the entire game and he has yeah. you know get tired and kind of stuff but i can think about it like having a good team and making that team better your job is to be the coach and to yeah. be able to bring all those people together and coordinate them there are strengths to both, and there to, there's no absolutes to this, right? There's only there's no um, absolutes. All right, shaded all right. grays of like, you know, this would work better. I, I would, I mean, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, of course, having a team that works well together is, you know, much more pleasant. Yeah. On the other hand, <laughs> kick ass is, is great stuff too, you know, knowing you can just throw them something and they work well. But if I assemble a team of experienced people who they're going to be able to, you know, at least pull it together and work together, because one of the things you have to do is to, pluck the bad apples out of the team and be, and be able to keep the team strong, you know? That's an important yeah. aspect. And so th there's no absolute, like, you know, one or the other. Both are going to produce, like, less than you would hope. And But, you know, if you can coach them right and get them together and get them to play nice and in increase their aesthetic, you can you can make you can make mediocre teams better and you can yep. make badass teams work better together. Right? Yeah. You're good so that's, that's my take on it. You know, there's, there's no one answer to that okay yeah so so like the the things that i went through and the things that i've seen um uh, it doesn't matter like the the yeah. mediocre team the mediocre team that works well together do they really okay let, let's 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 think about that yeah yeah um so i was working once at a company where the ceo said said to the entire company um the single most uh, important factor that I've seen in a team that succeeds is talent density. This is what he said, and it sounded it sounded good, right? Yeah, yeah it and sounded it's, good. It's like, oh, so a team with eight people that has uh, seven talented people is better than a team of a hundred people with fifty talented people. Um. And, and it was like, yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense, you know? And everyone's going through, but it's false. It's not true. Ultimately, depend, no matter what the composition of your team, right? Because we sometimes we get what we get. Sometimes we can't build mm -hmm. it from, from, yeah, absolutely. from the ground up. Real success comes from effective team leadership. Because if you have an effective leader, those mediocre artists turn into badass fucking artists, mm -hmm. right? And if you have ineffective leadership, a bunch of badass artists will give you designs that are executed well, that happen to be mediocre because you make the last fucking call. Mm -hmm. How many movies have we seen where you see a design that's like, man, this movie looks like ass, but but all the artists were really good that worked yeah, yeah, on it. What yeah, happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it yeah. really just comes down to effective leadership as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's true. You're a coach. You got to make it good. Yep. Make it good. You have to be able to effectively use those brushes. But again, if you think of artists in the most basic term, if they're tools, not to say that they're disposable or anything, but if they're tools, yeah, yeah. How effectively you can use them is is the question, right? Right. I mean, what what's the name of that movie with uh, uh, that that baseball movie, Moneyball? Have you guys seen the movie Moneyball? Moneyball? Moneyball. Um, yeah. Watch the movie Moneyball, and it, and it's it, you'll see how like they you know they figured out like it was effective leadership of putting together a team, and it's not it wasn't necessarily the people that were making the most hits or whatever, but they were really effective in choosing that. And they learned this in the Navy SEALs, where it's like you'll see two boat crews during buds, right? Buds is their their you know their training thing, right? Yeah. Um, and you'll see two boat crews, and one boat crew is out in the surf getting their ass kicked, and the other boat crew is succeeding and they're making it in, right? And it was all like one one the ineffective leader comes on and says, my team just sucks, right? Whereas the effective leader is like, oh, my team is awesome. So what they did is they switched, you know, they they switched. It's like, well, well, why didn't you command this boat and this other guy commands the other boat? The right. same results happened. The, the the effective leader took this this the team the so called team that sucks and and like. 
they did it. They did all of the yeah. tests they were asked to do. So there's no, there's no, there, instead of saying, would you rather, right? Like the, the real question is, are you effective enough as a leader, right? To yeah, be able absolutely. to take a mediocre team and make them fucking world-class. That's a much more important, more positive way to look at the problem than the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on to another question. All right. Well, more current situation. All right. With the current situation, what should artists expect from the game or film industry after COVID? Will there be a lack of job opportunities for young up and coming freelance artists or concept artists? Um, I can talk a little bit about what I've seen. Okay. Okay. Um, so far, I, I think world, you know, the, the world is sort of still hanging in there. Um, it's not that there's less opportunities. It's that the opportunities moved to different areas, right? Because right now, uh, um, live action is having a hard time because you can't do that work from home. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but uh, hmm. I'm, I'm, I predict there's going to be a, a, a surge of, of animated projects, uh, both for Netflix um, and, and for uh, I mean video games are video games right yeah. like, during yeah. I think during during COVID uh, Disney lost money and Sony got a lot of money <laughs> yeah mm, I agree <laughs> yeah all right so I, I think it's it's not so much that there's less opportunity out there it's just going to be a little bit more difficult for you to to find them um, and the, they they just move to different places but um, mm. Daniel what have you seen. Yeah, similar. Uh, live action took a hit because they can't they can't produce. And anytime you, know, like you have online or digital formats, mm -hmm. then it can. So you mean even movies are, are getting a hard hit right now, right? Oh yeah, for sure. I for mean, sure. yeah. Who's 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 watching them? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's having to release on them now on uh, uh, the Apple Store or whatever. Oh, well, um, Carlo, what about your friends who are currently designing for movies? What are they currently doing if movies are not an option right now? Um, some of them are still, I mean, they're, they're still working on some of these projects because, like, you know, eventually these things need to, be, need to be filmed. Some of them have been let go. You know, certain Netflix things have been canceled. Um, uh, other ones, it's, it's like you know, suddenly the, the, the team... The t and I won't speak to specific teams because I don't want to call anybody out. Certain teams, <laughs> which was were were bloated, and it, it was just kind of like we need all of these people. They've suddenly gotten a lot smaller, and only the really effective, good people that uh, that um, you know the company thinks are are uh, uh, instrumental in making sure that the project continues are the ones that are kept. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because like you know, there's certain people who go like, "Oh, I got into X Studio, yay!" I'm like, "How did that person get to X Studio?" As soon as COVID hit, oh, they were like, "Oh, right, <laughs> all right." So, um, our next question is, "I'm like, uh, someone asked that um, I'm interested in applying for a junior concept artist position in a AAA game studio in the future. So, uh, should I focus on designing?" On just one thing, like vehicles, like just focusing on just vehicles or say character or creature for my portfolio. Uh, what's, or just be decent at all. At all cases, yeah. <laughs> Would you be a generalist or a specialist, basically? Yeah. What's your strength? Play to your strength. Always say play to your strengths in portfolio stuff. So I always say that. Play your strength. Play your okay. Yeah. If you, if you, if you can't be impressive in one, in one, thing it, it's like yeah we just we just don't even look at your stuff hmm. what if like um you wanna like okay if i ask for myself like um if i want to do like my own ip and you kind of world build and you have to do like some environments and props at the same time would that work mm -hmm. against, against me or anyone who wants to build their own ip uh i mean if it's it has to be effective whatever you decide Okay. You know, if you're doing your own props, sure. But like, if you if you you create your own IP and you're gonna, what are you gonna do? You're gonna walk up to a publisher, or you're gonna go to an angel investor and I show see. them, show them your stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you can't impress them with the work, they're mm -hmm. not gonna believe in you enough to give you money. Oh, I. You agree. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So here's the thing: like, 
Uh, don't think of it uh, for for the people that are starting. Don't think of it as a junior position. There are no man. Okay, let's let's talk about basketball in the Philippines, right? Yeah. There are no junior positions on a basketball team. Okay. You're just a professional, or you're not, right? You might be a starting professional. You just you have to be a pro. You have to think that way. You have to think like like I I, I want to be a savage. Like I want to be an animal, right? So um. Do just create your most impressive stuff. Be able to do, create your most impressive stuff uh, consistently, so that you can deliver. That's the way to get in. Okay. All right. And also, should it like depend, kind of depend on a goal, right? Like, what are the targets you're trying to hit, something like that? Mm-hmm. Okay. I see. <laughs> All right. Um. Thank you for that. And um. Uh. Next so question. How, yeah. yeah, how do you deal with clients or art directors who give vague descriptions and design briefs? How do you still nail the design and make them happy? <laughs> does that does that happen? Yes. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> okay. So okay. here's the thing. Um, a lot of what Carlo and I learned about being good art directors is by having bad art directors. <laughs> <laughs> We, lo we, lo we learned, oh, I don't want to ever be this kind of person ever again and communicate <laughs> so vaguely and said, make it better or make it you know, more zing or more zap. It's like, well, <laughs> make it more aggressive. Yeah. Wow, make it... yeah. So uh, more visceral. Uh, like, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about that for a second. Um, so what you're trying to do is actually go from general to specific with an idea. You need to ask questions, find out if you're going in the right direction. Um, if you have a shorthand, you can you can basically do quick sketches and show them. If I, I have a methodology that go, goes from wide to goes to deep to goes to final, wide is basically a bunch of like you know ideas you're throwing out there. You okay. can render them at whatever level you want to try and hone in on that idea. But you have to ask questions. You have to form a relationship. If someone's just barking stuff at you, it'll never work. You have to basically either go off and do your own thing or get out of that position or find ways to you know talk to somebody who can give you good feedback as to whether you're going in the right direction or not. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I often equate it to like being, being navigating a maze and somebody is above you looking at that maze and just like, go faster. Like, Am I going in the right direction? Go mm -hmm. faster. <laughs> you know. and, and you have to be like, okay. as, a, as an art director, you have to learn the language, uh, not, just, not just the language that artists speak, but you have to learn a, a middle language where you're able to educate a creative director or even a bad art director as to what you're doing and make them feel comfortable as to what's going on. So clear mm -hmm. communication, it's all like, okay, we're going to do the, Daniel says we're doing wide. So we're going to do uh, mm -hmm. wide on, on, on an assassin character. And so I'm going to do like a Mongolian version of the assassin character. I'm going to do like a, um, a Middle Eastern version of the assassin character, a European version of the assassin character, and maybe a Southeast Asian version of the assassin character, right? And then I was, I'll set up like, um, you know, really clear weapons for each and have the ability to, to talk about the advantages or disadvantages in terms of our game engine and, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, our, our animation relative to uh, the weapons that we're using. So if we're using like a, a very strict, um, like soul, you know, Dark Souls kind of fighting system, that's going to lead to, oh, okay, we're actually not going to use daggers because that doesn't give us a long um, weapon to understand the edges of the characters when they animate. And I have to be able to communicate all of this stuff to uh, the, the quote unquote vague person. So the answer to, to, um, to vague art direction is giving specific, well thought out answers to the decisions that you've made. So if they're vague, you are clear, right? And you help them become clear. So instead of, and you always have to think in terms of like, um, uh, so there's this, I'm going to get into some tactical shit right now. There's this thing <laughs> called, the, there's some shit called the ODA loop, right? Um, O-O-D-A, right? It stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. This was a methodology that was created by the creator of Top Gun. Um, because it, it, in, in a life and death situation, it takes time for you to observe an action that's happening and then orient yourself relative to the act action, then deciding what to do about it and then acting. Hmm. It's about getting inside one's, one's reactionary gap. 
So be the feeder. If someone is not mm -hmm. giving you leadership, you be mm -hmm. the leader. You go in and you give them the solutions. You don't wait for them. You create the solutions for them. And it's like, and it's not an ego driven thing. It's like, I'm helping this person out because they're trying to find something. So if you're waiting, if you sit and you've gotten vague art direction and you're waiting on the art director to somehow magically give you the answer, he already threw the ball in your court. You're the one that's supposed to find that answer for it. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, it's like you said, it's a relationship. You, you talk about it, you discuss mm -hmm. it, you have, that's the most creative part you're going you're gonna to be in, right? After that, you get, it's a lot more process oriented. How do you yeah. get to that final? But at the beginning, it's very, very creative and dynamic. And that's probably the more fun part of it in terms of like design mm -hmm. and finding that design. It's, it should be a fun process. Yeah. Uh, to Daniel's point earlier, um, one of the things too, though, is as I grew in my career, I learned more to identify wh who was a bad art director and who was a good art director in an in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. Ooh, right, okay. I've learned that. And there's if if I if I could go back in time and 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 talk to my younger self about this, I would mm -hmm. go like, you need to learn that, and you need to be more forgiving to certain art directors that you've had because uh, how would you have been able to solve that situation? Right. Oh, and, yes. and, 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 and like, I think you, I haven't really had any horrible relationships, but I think I could have had like later on in my career, better relationships with some of these people that I could have just been more forgiving of and more understanding of when I was younger. Yeah. These guys kind of shape, uh, kind of shape, you know, and what you become, especially your career in the future, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so uh, one more last question, then we could wrap this up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so uh, I have a last question. It says, like, as art directors, how much of your time on the clock do you actually spend making art for projects versus overall task of filtering through the team's output or course correcting, like big responsibilities and stuff that's not art related? <clears throat> Uh, you can tackle this, Daniel. <laughs> Carlo, no, okay. So, <clears throat> how much do you do personal versus uh, work? Is that what the essential question is? Yeah, yeah. I think it depends on the project, though. Yeah, like, like, and where uh, the project's at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, you 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 take time to nurture your aesthetic. You still need to draw and paint. You still need to get that outlet out there. Mm -hmm. You get it. You, know, you want to be able to. Do that. It's a perishable skill, so you have to keep it going. Um, and so the thing is that you have to find your own balance. There's no like 20% today, 40% tomorrow. It's <laughs> really important to just get a feel for it. Okay. And kind of, um, like for example, if you're doing a lot of organic stuff, take some time off to do something non-organic or something environmental mm -hmm. you know, and, and find something that, yeah. that pleases you. Or, you know, go through a sketchbook or, or a, an old sketchbook and see how you've grown and then go look through a bunch of art that you love and then beat yourself up and then go draw something and, you know get yeah. that feeling you know it's, it's take a sketchbook and just you know go go crazy do stuff that's completely yeah. off the books and yeah. take the time to nurture yourself yeah Keep i think for, for me uh the answer is uh is is um comes from multiple vectors like one uh who am i right i am who i am i have the skill sets that i have right mm -hmm. yeah uh, and then and then what team have you uh, plugged me into? That's the second thing. And then the third thing is, where is the project? Are we starting from the very beginning? So I come from a concept art background. I'm not a tech artist. I'm not uh, a lighting artist. I'm not an environment artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a, I'm a concept artist. Um, that although I, 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 ca I can, I do mostly characters, I'm more than capable of, of painting an environment. So you put me, for example, if you, if you hire me, you hired me because you know who I am. Yeah. Uh, so initially, I'm, the, my initial position would be, I am the first concept artist and the art director on the team. So in the beginning, I might do a lot more art and painting so that I set a standard and start to create the initial um, art uh, pillars that other, uh, other people will then start yeah kind of walking into it. Yeah. 
you know, if I don't, if I don't establish that, that methodology, um, then I, I can't, I can't teach it. Now, mm -hmm. there are some, some cases where it's all like, you know what, we need, we're starting this, but we need all these things answered in two weeks. Okay. So then there's me having to go into a bunch of meetings with higher ups, like say as a creative director, you know, not just an art director, but um, I, I'm the vision holder. Like I'm being, I'm being known as a vision holder. So what happens then is I take a concept artist that I trust and I go, I'm going to do three sketches. You finish these three and I'm going to do the fourth one myself. And I'm going to paint it over the weekend and we're going to come up with an image. And by the end of two weeks, you and I are going to have like a big, big piece of splash art that, that like is a key painting. You'll see some of these key paintings, uh, you know, being done for the Marvel movies. That's going to convince everybody that this is the way it's going to go. So it's going to be something like that, right? So, uh, but by the middle of the process, I'm setting up the pipelines and going like, okay, this is how we're going to do. So I'm, I'm doing less painting. Towards the end of the process, it's like, I'm doing a lot less painting. I will have trained concept artists to do what they're doing. I would have taught the 3D artist this, you know, my aesthetic and how we're going to achieve it. And at that time, I'm just making sure that everybody is supported so that everyone gets the tools and the manpower and, um, and you know, the lunches that they need in order to continue the job. So at the beginning of the project, a lot more uh, personal artwork, at least this is for me, a lot yeah. more personal artwork. And towards the end of the project, it's just kind of like just advice because I trust everybody. They're already doing like what mm -hmm. they need to do. It's mostly hands off and, and just me kind of like tanking for the team to make sure that the, the upper leadership understands what we're doing and when we're going to achieve it. Okay. Thank you so much. That's yeah. really well explained though. Yeah. Um, I have an additional question for that though. Just a really brief one. Um, uh, why does some other studios have like art directors who uh, closest business deals, you know, or pitches ideas? Is that part of uh, an art director's job? Or is it sometimes? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. If you're going to, they're going to put you in front of a Russian billionaire and you're going to convince them that, you know, mm -hmm. your thing is the next hottest shit. Oh, like, okay. so learn to talk, homie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of uh, seal deals as well. It's part of your um, job. It can. It certainly can be. Okay. It certainly can be. Like if you're if you're talented enough, that's where you go. I mean, like Daniel's a very well-spoken, charming individual. Very charming. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard for me to keep. It's hard for me to keep my panties on. Around, <laughs> to be honest with you, oh, I'm always. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. Oh my god. Just not a secret anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's. That's mm -hmm. certainly like as an art director, mm -hmm. that certainly can become part of your job, especially on a small mm -hmm. team and, okay. and, and you're going and, and you're on a, a little tiny team and you have to speak to the publishers. You're going to be up there with the CEO and you, you have to be able to more than just create talking about how exciting the game is. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be able to talk about how the game will be successful, not just from the look, but how are you going to approach production or do you have an innovation, right? Like for example, a big innovation might be uh, uh, the character can traverse anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge innovation for, uh, for Assassin's Creed. Yeah. You know? And so like the art director might have to go up there and talk about like how, you know, how awesome this is going to be to do this sort of thing. Okay. What if the art director isn't really um, artistically inclined, but he was put in such a position to art direct a team? That's never happened before. <laughs> I doubt, yeah, I doubt that would happen. Like, why would you no, get it that happens. issue? It happens all the time. Happens? All the time. Uh, no, that happens all the time. Uh, you have to, who are you on the team? Like, if you're a lead artist on the team, if you're like a junior artist on the team, like ultimately, like, you know, if you, if you want to stay on that team, you have to figure out ways to help that guy succeed. You have to, like, if it, if it means, Oh, mag merienda muna tayo, boss. Oh, you gotta talk yeah. to the art director. Yeah, Let, okay. let's look. Let's, let's, can, can we have lunch? And I, I want to understand like what your methodologies are, what you're thinking. You know, you, and, and you make friends with a guy, man. Like, and and figure out like what what problems he's going through, or she's going through, so that you can support them the best way that you can, even if the dude's not good, 
right? Because because if you're actually if you've decided to spend your time or this is your opportunity, you know, this is your opportunity, right? And like in Eminem, this is the moment you're on the fucking stage. It doesn't matter if there's like cockroaches on the mic. Like, you know, this is your chance. So, uh, okay. you know, even if the guy's not a good leader, then it's like, well, help him be a good leader, man. Support him and then give him credit. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't oh fucking God. matter. You know, wow. because, because that guy's like, oh, shit, that's so and so supported me. So when it comes time to like, uh, so, so someone's asking, hey, hey, art director guy. So who do we promote to lead artist? Yeah, right. right? Yeah. You know, they're like, ah, let, let's prom let's let's promote Joe. Like Joe was he was there. He he stayed late. He helped me out. He did this thing, and like he helped me out with the rest of the team. Like he's he should be the lead artist, hmm. right? So there's there's two ways to look at it, and and there's there's times when you can't really fix it, and, and you have to be forgiving of the process, and you're kind of like, oh okay, well, uh, I mean Daniel and I have both been in those situations. Like, mm, yeah. Well, this project is fine, <laughs> right? <laughs> but at the same yeah. time. Even if the project is fucked, if you come out of that project having a good reputation um, among not just the art director, but the people working with you, true, true, yeah. they're going to get you like, oh, suddenly everybody was laid off because the project was fucked. But then Daniel got hired working over at Sony, but he's going to call me. He's going to go yeah, like, dude, yeah. uh, they're, they're looking for a concept art lead. I'm working on this project and they don't have a concept art lead. Can I put your name? Yeah, totally agree. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you need to think about this as an entire system and not just what and, and what Daniel said, not be myopic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, technically just do your job whether or not uh, that art director um uh is on your side kind of thing, right? Just do your why, job. Why why isn't he on your side? You gotta ask yourself that. You gotta figure out like how do I get on his side? What if right? he like okay, what if he like um tells you something that ends up that it was uh, not what the business people like, then he ends up blaming you kind of deal, you know. You need to understand why, like, why that happened. And, and like, there's, you have two choices, either lay down and die or fucking get up and fight. <laughs> Do you think there's only die. two choices? It's, it's only, it's, oh. it's a binary choice. Like, okay. and, and then figure out, figure out like what, what, how, how can you f fix this relationship? How can you make it so that he doesn't throw you under the bus? Right and, and go like okay well this, here's the, here's the business situation how can how can we solve this and it, you have to come up with a really good solution if you can't solve the actual thing that's in front of you is there a possible way for you to solve the process I know it's really hard especially if you're young if you're really young you don't have the tools for all this stuff like look when I when I walked into Machine Zone mm -hmm. the first thing that I noticed was that the art team and the the marketing team like the design team there was this one project right that I wasn't working on. But then they eventually put me in charge of it. But what I noticed about that project is the art team and the design team were not talking. And there was an active, there was active like hostilities between some other teams or whatever. But you, you know, you jump in there and you're like, okay, if I if I'm put in charge of a situation, I'm gonna walk in there and make friends immediately. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and and everybody was capable, everybody was doing good, but for some reason or another, something happened where the where people argued about stuff and the relationships broke down. So yeah. The first thing that I did was I go, I made a meeting with a marketing team and, and, and I talked to them and I go like, like, what were you guys' objectives when you were first trying to, you know, come up with the thesis for this game? Mm -hmm. and understood, you know, the problems they were going through. And I'm like, oh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to try to work the, over the weekend to see if I can come up with some, some good solutions and maybe we can come up with metho methodologies in order to be able to ship this whenever we need to ship this. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, like, even if it hurts you, get over it. Like, let it go become stoic you know try to go for the positive solution instead of like you know dwelling on 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 uh uh things you can't control yeah, here's that's... here's the other secret we're all nerds right mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of us understand the the uh the the reference kobayashi maru mm -hmm. right which is you know and, and the kobayashi maru is a shit impossible situation where the only the only every result means you die Right. Uh, okay. All right. right. It, it, like you know, it's from Star Trek. But a lot of people think that uh, oh, the way to solve this is to crunch and to work harder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you know, but that's not how Captain Kirk solved it. The way to solve it is to see if you can turn the problem sideways and change the rules of the game. That's the uh, highest level of of like problem solving and 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 design. 
which is like, can I change the rule? If, if I can't succeed with all the tools that I have right now, is yeah. there any possible way for me to change the rules of the game so that I can can succeed? Like find a solution like outside of the box. Find like a solution when you think there's no solution in sight. Yeah, and sometimes it's super hard. And I'm not saying this is an easy situation because like like I said, there's there's times where I've like I've had really bad dark situations and I'm, and I'll call Daniel or I'll call mm -hmm. Anthony or I'm like, mm -hmm. oh man, that you know, I felt betrayed by this thing. Yeah. But but then you 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 know, you, you're in the industry long enough, you start to develop the kind of confidence that's like, oh, this will pass and I'll find a solution, right? Yeah. You're just yeah. Not, I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, you're still you. You still got your powers and abilities. Nothing's taken yeah. away from you. And yeah. the other thing, it's important that Carlo brought this up in, in, in a way that I'm going to really reinforce is that you're creative. You're mm -hmm. creative problem solvers. That's why I love my concept artists. They're all creative problem solvers. And that is useful for any problem, not just art problems. Mm -hmm. okay. Use that creativity. Think about things in different ways. Don't just be tied into one approach. Mm -hmm. Open your mind to different approaches, and you know, it, and know that no one can take anything away from you. No one can reach into your brain and take away your art ability. You know, it's it's only the they can beat you down with a bad situation and that happens. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different situation. Everybody's going to have a different experience. But as long as you can hold on to your yourself, your resilience, believe in yourself, have confidence nurture your creativity and your abilities, you'll always find work. Yeah. Agree. Oh, that's so inspiring. And that's really a good, um, good mood to end this uh, demo. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, probably guys. like to wrap this up, we'll ask one last question, short answers. Like what, okay. it, what would be like your best tip or, you know, advice for starting artists who want to be in the industry as well? And we'll end it on that point. Um, Get knocked down eight times, or get knocked down seven times. Get up seven. <laughs> yeah, be a be a super saiyan. You know, yeah. just basically be a super you have, saiyan. Has yeah. to be like a, you have to basically understand that you're not good at everything yet. You're not mm -hmm. good at anything yet sometimes, but you will get better if you decide to be better. Art is one of those situations, one of those things where you, with your own two hands, can pick yourself up and make yourself better and more marketable and move yourself up in the industry the way you want to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so nurture yourself, uh, you know, learn to learn to take criticism, learn to understand what people are saying to you and when to discard it and when to accept it by understanding how it fits in the context of your own learning. And <clears throat> focus on getting better, put the hours in, you know? Yeah. It's just effort, that's all it is, it's effort. It's, it is effort, it effort. is effort. I mean, like, what's the, what's the choice, you know? Mm -hmm. The choice is to not do it and then to do something else, to give up. If you if you don't look, not everybody has the uh, the internal resources to be strong, and that's understandable. And maybe this 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 field is not for you, you mm -hmm. know. And you have to be realistic about that. But at the same time, it doesn't matter where you come from. If if you're good enough and you're resilient enough, okay. Ako batang sampalo ka ko hindi naman ako pinanganak dito eh. You mean you're you're sour? Nah, just kidding. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> Nako. Yeah, you grew like, up in some palop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, that, that's where my, you know, that's where my blood comes from. It's just, it. <laughs> Sorry. Like, if my parents, if if they if they decided, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll we'll just stay here in the Philippines, not go to the states, and whatever. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's one of those things where it's it's like, you have to be strong enough to choose. Mm -hmm. to work at this right and it, no matter how many times you failed every every failure is just data so so yeah. if i have to to, to 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 you know long story short this thing failure is just data every time you fail it just gives you an opportunity to fix it so you can get get it right okay yeah and you for my advice i just say that you 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 win or you learn you win or you you hurt you learn learn okay yeah yeah you win or you learn you, there's no failure you win right. you this, 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 that's true you know, to, to make it nerdy again it's the xanatos gambit right <laughs> like if, <laughs> if you've ever watched if you ever watch gargoyles the xanatos gambit is a is a is a if you if you win you win if you lose you still win, win. yeah <laughs> so that's what like, you think yeah yeah 
So if you both of you guys didn't um, go to the U.S., would you still pursue this career if you stay? Oh, yeah. Here? Yeah. Are you yeah. kidding? Yeah. I'm not kidding. I'm I, I'm here. Yeah. Not- well, I mean, I still. I mean, like, there's more opportunities now. Like, look, look, look mm-hmm. at Lionel Francis Yu. Right? Do you guys know who he is? Lionel Francis Yu. Yeah, Lionel Yu. Yeah. yeah he's a Lionel Yu, the, the, the comic book artist. Yeah. He lives there, makes US dollars, and he's living probably much more comfortably than I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, why not? The world is global now. You can reach out. Like, back in the day, the, the, the only way I could get, I didn't have this. I didn't have the web to rely on. I had to physically move to Los Angeles with $150 in my pocket and go from studio to studio with a, mm-hmm. with the um, the portfolio, which was physical that I had to spend money on, right? You know, getting these photographs developed, you know, I must have spent at least $120 on just the portfolio alone, right? Yeah. Like, it's so much easier for you guys. Uh, you just, you guys just need to find where. Where are people looking? Yeah, totally. And then how to stand out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Master the new medium. A new medium is, is the internet. You master that as a medium. Yep. Some yeah. people have. I mean, look at Sakini Chan. She's figured it out. Yeah. Oh, she has. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, some, Mal- some Malaysian girl with a roommate in, 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 in you know, was it Kuala Lumpur or whatever the fuck? And she's just sitting there making hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah. So man, just you know, figure out your audience, get to them. Yeah. True. Okay. That's all right. All right. Guess that'll be it for our uh, live stream for for today. So um, we're gonna wrap this up for tonight and um, mm-hmm. tomorrow around two p.m. We're gonna have a uh, part two with um, uh, Daniel Kabuko's uh, Legacy of Kane. He's gonna talk more about how they develop and how uh, how they developed the game and how they came up with the design. So I hope you guys would still <clears throat> would still stay tuned. Uh, yeah. See you guys like that. That will be 11 p.m. LA time. And uh, also, I wanna thank Carlo for giving us three hours of your life. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. No thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate this. And uh, also the uh, decab. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, also, we'll, we'll, we'll post a, a link to, I'm, I'm going to be teaching a class in October, um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll post a link to it uh, with, with the moderators so that you guys, like, if you, if you guys want to take the class. I, I hardly ever teach these days, yeah. so this is uh, one of those uh, rare opportunities that I'm, I'm actually going to be teaching. Yeah, most yeah. of the time, most of the time I'm teaching my coworkers and <laughs> not teaching classes anymore, but uh, I will be teaching this fall um, and I'll send you the, send you guys a link. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah, I'll be uh, working at Patreon soon with the uh, Soul Reaver stuff. So uh, I'll send you a link for that too. It's Yeah. Be fun. Yeah. We'll, we'll Absolutely put stoked. all of those in the, uh, in the bio. <laughs> we'll be uploading this, um, this video on YouTube on our uh, podcasting channel, then all the links, their links, you can check it out on the description. So don't worry, you guys won't miss anything. Yeah. Again, thank you to our guests for tonight, today. Thank you for all the people who are watching. Thank you for, you know, keeping, uh, supporting us, you know. We have 7,000 likes though, it's amazing. Oh wow, that's great. Yeah, we can't, like, thank you much. You know, thank you everybody. Thank you enough. All right, have a good evening, guys. All right. Good evening, guys. Again, yeah. I am Salam Ganisa. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And J, uh, DJ Lumpia in the technical part. DJ Lumpia. Right. Okay. Okay. Now I'm hungry. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And this is our first Brush Point Live. And thank you. Thank you guys so much. Peace. Yeah. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.